Yeah, I know that it's a bit crowded in here. Um, we will try to have a short break after each item so that people who are here for each for, for, for one application can go and other ones can 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 come in. Thank you. Um, start with apologies for absence and substitutions, please. So we have apologies from councillors Railton, Hollingsworth and Kerr, and we have councillor Douglas for councillor Railton and councillor Corre for councillor Hollingsworth. Thank you. And I, I, um, I should have said that this is being recorded, it's being live streamed, but if any of you want to record it, you can do so, but if you could just kindly let us know. Thank you. Um, moving on to item two, which is declarations of interest. Um, I'll start by saying that I have a personal, but I don't believe a prejudicial interest in item three, in that I live in the area close to the John Radcliffe Hospital. But I don't believe that it's a prejudicial interest at all. Thank you. Councillor Upton. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> yes, I'll excuse myself for the item on the Osney Bridge, because uh, I've been involved in various discussions trying to secure funding for that piece of infrastructure. And although I, I don't think it, uh, that it renders me incapable of deciding whether the bridge complies with our planning policies or does not comply with our planning policies, to avoid any perception of predetermination, I'll leave the room for that item. Thank you. Councillor Corre. Uh, yes, I... I, I also um, have one item in, uh, the, in, in today the meeting is about the CASAN. Um, um, I don't remember the number I need to open. I think it's number four. 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 Uh, uh, I also uh, participate five. in what, what's that? Five. five. Sorry, mm -hmm. number five. Uh, I participate also um, in the, this plan application. What does mean? I will leave the, the room when we discuss this plan application. Thank you. Thank you. I think Councillor Chapman. Yeah, I've got two remarks to make. First of all, about the, uh, the first substantive item on the agenda. It is in my ward, uh, but I've had no conversations or engagement about it anyway and come with an open mind. Um, and in relation to item four, which is the um, South Side Oxpens Road, I'm a member of the cabinet. I'm also a member of the um, shareholder joint venture group, which has a sort of tangential interest in this. So I feel really so the, while I would come to it with an open mind, I can see there's a risk of perception that I wouldn't, and therefore I will recuse myself from that item. Councillor Mundy. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, so I've been in contact with a member of the public um, in regards to item number four, um, but I've come to this meeting with a free and open mind and informed that of that case as well. So I will be staying in the meeting for that item. And... Councillor Malik. Thank you, Chair. I wasn't going to mention until you said you live near the GR. I also live near the GR, but I have nothing to do with anything because I'm not very far. <laughs> but uh, I just want to, for the tra transparency sake, uh, I had a word with the head of legal and also last time with the Sally. Uh, I did uh, fundraise because whenever any natural disaster happened, I go to all the mosques in Oxford and do fundraise outside. I'm not a member of Medina Mosque or anything, which is on item six. Thank you. Councillor Raymond. Yeah, um, item, agenda item three. I also live close by, so I don't think it makes any difference. And I'll come here with an open mind. Thank you. Councillor Khan. I don't know whether there is a declaration. Every application people do contact you or send you email or phone you. Yeah. But you don't say anything, so we were stopped at the doorstep, and people uh, keep saying different things. So we hear, but we make decisions here, open mind, whatever they say. We don't reply or don't make over judgment at that time. So no, absolutely, and I, th yeah. I suspect that all of us have received applications on yeah. an, um, representations on a number of these applications, and provided that when we have responded to people, we have not. Um, taken a view that's completely acceptable thank you okay we move on to item three which is the john radcliffe hospital and over to mike i think sorry sorry felicity
Thank you, Chair. So this is an application at the John Radcliffe Hospital. Uh, the site plan is here in front of you. It's a small area within the hospital, um, sort of to the rear at the back, um, on car park one, which is shown outlined in red on the site plan. Um, so as you come in from Headley Way at the bottom uh, left of that uh, slide, you, it's up and behind uh, the children's hospital and the um, eye hospital. This is just another map of the actual hospital site to show you just a little clearly in red, the application site um, in front of the turquoise buildings, which is the children's hospital and the West Wing Eye Hospital. Um, it sort of sits to the north of the, um, uh, the I get the acronym right, the Oxford Magnetic Resonance Imaging Buildings um, to the, um, and also the functioning MRI brain of the brain building and to the west of, uh, roughly the west of the ACIU, which is the Acute Vascular Imaging Centre, which has had a recent extension to it, which you may recall granting planning permission for. So just uh, showing you views as you come in up the internal road uh, through the John Radcliffe and you've got the uh, West Wing on your right hand side. The site is in front of you there, uh, just moving up um, at the front of the site, looking back towards the West Wing. Into the site across the car park one, uh, you've got the OMRI buildings and the M. FMRIB buildings is central there and to the left you can see the new extension there of the ACIU and just panning then around to the left you can see that extension and the buildings there um, in front of you uh, in the uh, behind the close boarded fence are some plant associated with the ACIU as well and then looking back up the internal road that goes round the back um, and on the left you've got the Wolfson building then further into the site, you can see where the development would connect into the existing hospital building. So sort of the left hand side, it would connect into the children's hospital there. That's sort of uh, three, those three horizontal windows. And then to the panning to the right is where it would connect into the hospital wing. Looking from Headington Cemetery, this is sort of middle way through the, uh, in the actual Headington Cemetery, you can see the hospital wing at the eye hospital and the left is a little house that belongs to the cemetery and sort of a wide shot view uh, there uh, with the Wolfson building in the front uh, to the left hand side, uh, which would be in front of the new building. And you can see the high uh, Leyland Eye hedge that forms the boundary between the cemetery and the hospital. From Ingalls Close, the view would be through the trees and you can, it's not very easy to see, but um, if you can see my mouse, that's the blue of the eye hospital wing just behind those hedges. So it's a bit of a glimpsed view. And then from the corner of um, Residential Road, Ambleside, Coniston Avenue, and um, again, you can just see the hospital building behind the houses and the trees there. <coughs> so just showing you the plan form of what is a proposed extension to the hospital. Um, it's over five levels and it's an awkward shape as you can see from the, uh, the block plan in front of you. Um, it is approximately uh, 14,000 square meters of, um, of new floor space uh, that connects into the hospital and the children's, the children's hospital in the eye wing um, by a long connecting link corridor. Just showing you the existing buildings and then the proposed buildings in there. It's not very easy to see the existing buildings in, in this view. So the proposal would provide seven new operating theatres. It's of a modular construction, and these theatres would um, uh, help to meet the current demand for operations. And it, it's also been designed to add in for future capacity. 
This would re uh, reduce waiting lists for surgery building and um, also build in future capacity. Um, it has huge uh, implications for meeting the needs and the demand for uh, surgery in Oxford, Oxfordshire itself, and actually the South East Integrated Care System region. So it's quite, it's wide reaching the benefits of this proposed development. Just taking you through, this is the link corridor. Uh, it's approximately 68 meters long, three and a half meters wide and 40 meters high. And just showing you a CGI image of the proposed extension, which would be uh, at a max uh, 27 meters high, 42 meters wide at the front, which would be across that sort of whitest part, as you can see from the floor plan, and um, uh, 27 meters at the back there. The development would also um, provide approximately 174 new full-time jobs for staff linked with the surgical clinical care. Uh, this view is from uh, the internal road where you have the Wolfson building on your right-hand side and in the foreground there with the three round, uh, square windows um, is the new plant room which helps to provide uh, the energy needs, um, some of the energy needs for the new development in a new self-contained building. Um, and a an, uh, sort of eye level view down to the extension there with the disabled parking and, and visitor drop off spaces that would be retained from the car park. Um, there would be 16 retained spaces um, and the rest of the visitor spaces would be uh, provided uh, elsewhere within the existing car parks of the hospital. And this would displace existing staff car parking for the hospital. This is an internal view of the link corridor, basically, into the hospital. So just taking you through those floor plans, um, the, the yellow denotes the sort of circulation space and the green is the footprint. So you have the um, basement, uh, ground floor, level one, ground floor theatre, level two, ground floor theatres. Um, the third floor is given up to plant because they need an awful lot of it. And levels four and five are um, for future capacity. And this would be future clinical activity associated with the, with the theatre. So it would provide a surgical hub. And top roof floor, uh, top roof plan. Uh, to the left of that picture, the small, the sort of darker box is external plant. It's also required. And just some images of the two-storey enclosed plant. This provides some of the plant that's needed to connect into the hospital's uh, heating district heating system, where they uh, provide energy through steam, or electricity through steam. So just looking at some of those views, um, as we know, uh, the hospital buildings are prominent in some of these views. Um, and particularly in the view from Ellsfield and the view cone, it's not strictly within the view cone, it's actually sort of, but you know, the view cones aren't static and you move about. So therefore the building would sit uh, in the bottom photo, if you can see, it would sit within the massing of the existing buildings. It would rise above some of the lower buildings in that view uh, in between the two uh, taller buildings. Um, and would sort of add to the overall mass. And again, from St Mary's Tower looking out, they are prominent on the view and sort of affect the setting of the Headington Conservation Area. Um, the lower image there in red, the solid red, shows the amount that you would glimpse above the existing buildings in that view. Again, adding to the existing mass and in the views from Headington Cemetery, which is would affect the old Headington Conservation Area, again, it would sit within those uh, buildings um, and would be seen above the Wolfson building I showed you, but again, adding to the existing massing. In view of the impact that the existing buildings have, which, um, which is a less than substantial harm to the setting of the conservation areas, um, due to the increase in mass, 
um, that would be caused um, and therefore the increased uh, visual distraction in these views um, officers consider that the development would cause a high level yeah. of less than substantial harm. That said, we consider that the very, very significant benefits that this extension would, would provide yeah. in terms of uh, much needed hospital surgical uh, theatres that would reduce backlog, and uh, not only for Oxford, Oxfordshire, but also for the South East region, um, uh, outweigh the harm in this, in this instance. Yeah. Just turning to some of the key issues uh, arising other than the views. Um, in terms of transport, uh, the current car park provide, provides 152 spaces. And as I've said, um, some would be retained on site. The 127 visitor spaces uh, remaining would be um, Less, less the ones that are retained on the site would be reprovided elsewhere in the existing car parks for the hospital and this would displace staff parking and therefore there would be an overall loss in staff parking spaces. Um, as part of the um, overall package, the, uh, the hospital are undertaking a framework transport strategy for the whole hospital site because they recognise the importance of the hospital as one of the largest employers, but also the impact that they have on the uh, uh, wider Headington area and congestion um, caused by um, traffic generation from the hospital. So this framework transport strategy will support all capital projects coming forward, not just this one. They're looking at a, a suite of um, um, measures to help reduce uh, the need of their staff to travel to the hospital by car and try and shift them into more sustainable modes of transport. This includes um, re-looking at their staff eligibility for parking permits, uh, getting staff to pay for their spaces now, um, offering 200 spaces over some of the park and rides for their staff to use, car sharing and um, improving the cycle parking provision at the hospital, which, which desperately needs overhauling to make it covered secure and, um, and also include for um, electric cycles, etc. The county as highways authority raised no objection to the application subject to conditions securing the framework transport strategy, a travel plan, a car park management plan, um, and cycle parking securing the 35 spaces needed for this specific um, development. And also a contribution of um, uh, approximately 170,000 pounds towards the Eastern Arc bus route, which will, as you all know, um, enable buses uh, to take people from the north right round to the south of, of Oxford along the east. Um, this will tie in with um, the new traffic filters that are coming in, where the county expects that, in fact, um, people will, more people will use buses as they get restricted coming in by car. And then this contribution will significantly help and mitigate the impact of this um, development. Just turning to other issues, um, in terms of trees, you will note uh, from my report uh, that we have been waiting for an updated landscape and um, uh, tree canopy assessment and also updates on, on the biodiversity net gain. Um, we have received an updated landscape plan and tree canopy cover assessment, which uh, um, satisfactorily demonstrates where the trees would be planted, reprovided and lost and um, that the tree canopy cover lost would be um, replaced over 25 years. There are a, a few individual trees on the site and um, officers are content that the mitigation tree planting, um, uh, the tree planting will mitigate the loss of these trees in the future. Um, in terms of the biodiversity net gain, Again, the scheme of 11 trees that they're proposing elsewhere in the hospital grounds, which is considered to be off-site because it's off the application site, would satisfactorily 
um, meet the minimum 5% net gain of our, um, our policy. Um, it's actually 10%, so it also would meet um, the Environment Act. This could be secured by Section 106 agreement, which is set out in the report. <coughs> um, lastly, in terms of flood risk and drainage, um, concerns have been raised by uh, residents about, uh, about this. Um, the development would provide an ad uh, appropriate drainage strategy and sustainable drainage is proposed. The car park itself at the moment is hard standing and the water runs off uncontrolled in an uncontrolled manner. Uh, the development would attenuate the water, it would release it slowly, and it, in fact it would be a betterment over the current ex, um, situation. Thames Water have raised no objection to the development connecting into their infrastructure, and the county as lead local flood authority has raised no objections subject to conditions securing uh, the sustainable drainage strategy proposed. Therefore, officers are satisfied that there would be no increased uh, flood risk elsewhere off site. In terms of amenity on neighbours, uh, due to the um, sort of topography, distance to residents, and the nature of the development, there'd be no adverse impact on neighbouring residential amenity. Um, I just had um, one other thing to uh, raise, which is a late comment from OPT, which um, stated that they had no objection in principle to the additional building and note that it's five stories in height and would be comparable to a number of existing buildings on the site. But they felt that the development uh, should have been, uh, the views of the development should have been assessed from Raleigh Park. Uh, which actually officers did, and that is dealt with at paragraph 10.29 of the officers' report. And therefore, as with Mary's Tower and Ellsfield, the uh, potential uh, additional bulk massing and the high level of lesser substantial harm would be outweighed in this case by the benefits of the development proposed. Um, finally, then, um, officers are recommending approval for this development um, due to the fact that we've received an adequate landscape plan and tree canopy cover assessment and the biodiversity net gain has been demonstrated. We are just amending our recommendation to committee just to remove those references um, at section one and therefore we are recommending approval subject to conditions and a, a legal agreement. Thank you, Chair. <coughs> Thank you, Felicity. Um, before we go on, I just want to, to remind Councillor Douglas that because he came in during the um, presentation that he will not be able to, to vote on this application. OK, thank you. I think now we have... Sorry. And I've just become aware of a declaration of interest I need to make, which is that I'm a, a trustee and a member of OPT, but I take no part in any conference they ever make on planning applications, so I've come with an open mind. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. We have um, a speaker um, against the application, and then we've got two people for the application. Each has five minutes. Mr. Potts, are you here? Thank you. Uh, yes. Hi. Yeah, Ken. Okay. This application provides a social benefit and will reduce staff parking by 127 places. So far, so good. But one of a long series with cumulative impact will exacerbate the housing crisis, requiring 70 to 80 dwellings for 174 staff plus ancillary workers and dependents, increasing the need to travel, adding to the climate crisis and poisoning us and our fair city with ever more traffic. Therefore, it does not conform to the local plan as a whole, as the transport situation is already unacceptable, RE6 and RE7, nor is it as simple as stating the site policy does not require any provision for housing to counterbalance any increase in staff numbers. Some history. In the statement of common ground of November 2019 between the Trust and Oxford City Council, the parties agreed not to set a specific local plan housing policy as the hospital sites were, quote, complex brownfield. And I quote, policy RE2 will be important in ensuring efficient use of land and maximum appropriate densities are achieved and the final housing yield from sites, including on the trust three sites, will be determined at the planning application stage. And here we are at the application stage with no offset housing except a small uplift to IB Lane Flats. 
or uh, external to this application. Although the trust had demands, uh, demanded a local plan housing number target increase from 8,620 homes to 10,000, well, um, and further, the trust stated housing needs in Oxford. Uh, housing need is in Oxford City Council's jurisdiction is a separate district-wide consideration. Creating the housing problem, the trust feels no responsibility for the solution. But plentiful housing for cars. Oh, those lovely green vistas and rows of tin and tarmac. God forbid this centrally located sustainable land be used for staff housing when all those hideous green fields and parks can be concreted over. So enamoured is the trust with the 2,600 car parking spaces at the John Radcliffe out of 4,646 across three hospitals, double the entire city parking, of which 70% are for staff at £65 per annum, salary-based. It sent a team to the JR site local plan hearing on the 11th of December 2019 and blocked the council putting reduced parking in its site policies. Not content, it also demanded an increase, and I quote, an increase to on-site parking should be considered as part of a site-specific operational assessment seeking to balance operational needs, space requirements, efficient use of land and, where relevant, attracting retaining staff at the hospital site, but failed to get this through. So parking is a staff perk, paid for by the rest of the community in green space, traffic, pollution, environmental damage and housing need. More parking is required, it seems, to reduce queues to the parking. So the proposed conditions five and six in the officer report, the framework transport strategy and the travel plan, therefore are a meaningless, toothless string of platitudes that sound good but mean nothing as a council is powerful, powerless to enforce reduction. The time frame is elastic, measures, measures impacts, not solutions, with no objectives or measures of success. It's success except to encourage sustainable modes of transport. Even the dread word reduce parking is absent and is legally challengeable as it imposes site-wide conditions not directly to, to related to the development, precisely how the Trust managed to throw out the reduced parking in the first place, none of which will impact just park ETC with thousands of spaces available in the Headington area alone. As nothing beats the £65 per year parking pass to propose a 170 thousand contribution to the famous and yet never delivered Eastern Arc buses only for everybody else. The sill levy of 475,000 looks very dandy, but I suspect it won't pay a brass reserve as a charity, as per the universities, once again dumping the consequences and costs on the community. We pay dearly for these car parks in green space, city parks, 3 million on the flood alleviation scheme at Marsden, 30 million on access to Headington, and the environmental, environmental and social catastrophe they represent. Traffic filters at Marsden Road and elsewhere will funnel even more traffic into Headington via Saxon Way, Headley Way and London Road. The NHS is not going to pay a workplace levy of 2.7 million for 4,646 car parking spaces at £600 each, and neither are its low-paid staff. In conclusion, the council is powerless. The trust must be a good citizen and change course to provide housing for staff, not cars, and save our fair city from the environmental, social and health disasters its football fields of parking inflict on it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Pott. Are you happy to stay there so that in case anyone has any questions for you? Yeah. Okay, thank you. And now I've got um, Mr. Nardi and Ms. Webster. Would you like to come forward? And I understand that we've also got um, some other trust representatives um, who are available on Zoom. Is that right? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Good evening. Um, is that working? Yeah. Sound? yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Good evening. So I'm uh, Mr. Colin Nardi, a consultant spine surgeon uh, specialising in spinal surgery. And uh, this is my colleague, Dr. Ruth Webster, a consultant anaesthetist who has specialist interests in anaesthesia for trauma, emergencies and spinal surgery. So our expertise lies in the medical world. And we are here to represent Oxford University Hospitals and our patients this evening as we speak in support of this proposed new theatre complex for the John Radcliffe Hospital, which we both feel is clinically needed. Um, we're sure you will have seen the headlines about the pressures on the NHS nationally. There are large increases in acute urgent work, pressures to ensure cancer patients get their urgent treatment, and high numbers of patients waiting for routine, non-urgent planned surgery, such as hip and knee replacements. And locally, this situation is no different. In December 2023, Oxford University Hospitals had 80,599 patients waiting for surgery. 
and this was up from 72,519 in December 2022. Of the 80,599 patients, 4% had been waiting longer than a year. As clinicians, we know that long waits for treatments can have significant impact on the physical and mental and psychological health of individuals. I see this in my young patients awaiting surgery for scoliosis. In layman's terms, scoliosis is a wonky or curved spine. Many of my patients suffer significant psychological impact as they are self-conscious of how bent their spines are becoming, which only worsens with a long wait and fearful of when their surgery might be, given it can be so difficult to predict this. Additionally, they often become increasingly less active due to their concerns about their appearance and pain and reductions in physical activity at a young age can have lifelong damaging implications. These deteriorations in patients, physical, mental and psychological health, when waiting a long time, are well known. For my patients with scoliosis, this might mean more pain and a longer recovery after surgery. For some of our older patients, not only is the impact of the long wait an increased likelihood of a longer time as an inpatient, but there is a higher likelihood of needing a period of rehabilitation in one of our community hospitals. Add to this the increased need for input from GPs, community health services and social care providers, both before and after surgery, and the clear benefits in ensuring patients can have prompt surgery are obvious. So why do we need to provide this increased activity at the John Radcliffe Hospital rather than any of our other sites? As many of you will know, the John Radcliffe Hospital houses Oxfordshire's main emergency department and as a consequence provides acute medical and surgical services for the population of Oxfordshire. Additionally, cardiothoracic, neurosurgical and major trauma services for the, our region are located at the John Radcliffe site and they need to be they need to be located at this site um, for operational reasons. They can't be split up and moved to other places. As the demand for emergency surgical services continues to grow, the outcome is that there is no longer sufficient space for all the routine planned surgery that needs to happen on the John Radcliffe Hospital site. This is not just our opinion. As previously mentioned, the Southeast Integrated Care Systems region has identified that John Radcliffe Hospital requires increased capacity. So in conclusion, we understand that the experts in planning and technical areas have submitted a thorough report to you, which we as clinicians would like you to accept, because we feel there will be huge benefits for patients and their families as we unlock additional capacity and reduce waiting lists. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And equally, if you're happy to stay there and answer questions from the committee. Thank you. Right. Um, now over to committee for, for questions, either to Felicity Byrne or to our speakers. Councillor Mundy. Yeah, uh, to our uh, speakers for the, from the NHS. Uh, uh, thank you for coming. Yeah, so I've got a question about cycle parking, um, which is in the proposal, states that there'll be 35 cycle bays, but it does say that there's not going to, there's no specifics on the form of those bays. Um, and exactly where they'd be cited. And my question was, as it does recognise in the report that providing more provision for cycle parking is, is important for the sole site. <clears throat> Why is it not more specifically stated in the report how that would be provided at that particular place? And also, as the 35 bays are proposed as specifically uh, that number, uh, how have you come to that number without actually having that clarity on the space and dimensions that would be required for it? Thanks. Um, I think we're going to refer to our colleagues who have more knowledge yeah. in this area as, as we're clinicians. It's yeah, not really right. our area of expertise. It's not, it's not Sorry. Our remit. Sorry. I think that um, our planning officer is able to, to you able to respond to that. Uh, yes. So the cycle parking spaces are to the rear, uh, proposed to the rear of the, um, if you can see from here. Um, there is an area to the rear in the courtyard uh, at the back where my mouse is shown, which um, we have a, a, a plan that they submitted that shows 35 cycle stands could could go there. 
Um, we would secure by condition um, what they actually look like and the exact positioning and make sure that they're safe, secure. Um, and that would feed into the over wider sort of uh, strategy for looking at um, cycle parking across the whole hospital site as well. So officers are satisfied that we could deal with it by condition. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Councillor Raymond, Councillor Fowler, Councillor. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I've benefited from your surgeries. Um, I've had a Harrington rod and a knee replacement. Um, but to the officer, thank you. Um, but to the officer, um, sounds a bit, feel a bit guilty, but you know the to shorten the waiting list and stuff like that. Is that a planning issue, just to be clear? Yes, it, it's it's about the need for the development. So um, we need to make sure that uh, what they're providing meets a, meets a need. And certainly that in terms of balancing um, the benefits of the scheme against any harm in terms of heritage as well. So yes, it's a planning consideration. Uh, Councillor Fowler, then. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I want to just uh, uh, follow on from uh, Councillor Mundy's uh, point about cycle parking. I notice there are two conditions, five and seven, which um, talk about cycle parking, but it, it's not entirely clear whether this is only for staff or whether that includes cycle parking for any visitors who might be mobile enough to cycle there. So could you just clarify that, please? I would need to just double check that unless um, I believe the um, transport consultant is is either here or on online. Hi. Yeah. Are you able to answer that question? I'm not sure. So I'm Mark Holloway, Chief of States and Facilities Officer for the, for the organisation for OUH. So we've our cycle um, storage is available for staff and patients and visitors. Um, so in terms of the proposal being put forward, they will be available for everybody to use. We don't distinguish and define specific cycle parking for any particular cohort. They're available for everybody and we will continue with that policy in this particular planning application. Thank you. Okay. Councillor Malik, you had a question. Yeah. Uh, just so currently where the surgery takes place, that's, that's the question because you said you require the... Sorry, the John Radcliffe Hospital site. Uh, um, so surgery that could be done on other sites is, of, is often moved to other sites. What's happening at the minute is there are elective lists planned and um, due to the overriding, overwhelming number of emergencies that we, we, feel, we face on a daily basis, what often happens is patients get their surgeries cancelled on the day of surgery because there just is not the physical space to do all of the work in. And this includes lots of um, moves by people who've tried to read rejig schedules, um, to work on, um, I mean, Saturdays now in all of our theatre complexes pretty much like Monday to Friday. They're very busy um, days. So uh, the capacity to use the real estate that we have is has been, um, it's been stretched and stretched and we just don't have the physical space anymore to put anything else into where we are. And to, to add to that, to generate more capacity, we're now operating on sites outside of Oxfordshire. So, for instance, uh, the spine department has lists running regularly in London where our surgeons go to London to operate on patients. Can, can I just come in um, with a question then, um, Councillor Khan? Um, obviously, you are preparing for, for future need and so the, the, the top two floors, as I understand it, are going to be empty initially. Do you have an idea about how the staffing is going to sort of build up over time? So obviously those 174 extra staff 
will not all be there when the building first comes into operation. Do you have an idea about how that's going to scale up over time? Um, I I know within my own department, so I'm an anaesthetist, we need a lot of we need a lot of new more anaesthetists to um, man this. There's already a plan about how they would start to recruit um, extra people. Um, that doesn't necessarily, I'm going to be honest, that doesn't necessarily mean they will, we will all be there at the outset. Um, it, but there is a, there's a scaled path of how to get there and there is a plan of that. And I understand um, similar plans are being put in place for um, nursing staff and um, surgeons as well. Thank you. So, Councillor Altaf Khan. <clears throat> Thank you. There is a, a contribution mentioned for the bus services. Um, there's always an application coming in bits and pieces of John Redcliffe area. And I think in the past I have asked a similar question. Does the John Redcliffe or the NHS Trust have a, a master plan of where they're looking in next head of 10, 15 years or 20 years, that master plan, not only dealing with your buildings, but the surrounding problems like transport, staff, all that movement. So do you have that uh, in a document shape, uh, which you can let us know or the neighbors or whoever wants to see how this place would be next 10, 20 years? So um, I'm actually going to speak as an employee of the trust now rather than as a representative on the application. And at the minute, the trust are um, undertaking a massive consultation with all of their staff, trying to work out how to get them, um, how to maximise all the things that you're asking about, how to maximise getting people onto their bikes, how to make sure that as many people as possible use um, buses. And um, within that consultation, um, they're, they're asking about sort of, you know, when do people, where do people need to get to on their buses? Where, where, what would, uh, what do people need to encourage them to cycle? And not just when do they need to get to places on their buses, but also, um, you know, uh, what's, what's, the, what's the shift time end? They've already done quite a lot of work, I understand, with um, the local bus companies at slightly shifting some of the bus timetables so that they do now align better with staff start and finish of shift times. I haven't actually seen the full policy. There, there is. We've actually had this week a further um, questionnaire to ask us as staff members how we intend to, cap, you know, how, what would encourage us to become more sustainable in the way we travel to work. So I don't know if that. I, I'm going to look at Mark now, as that's his area. But it, there may not actually be something master written down at the minute. But I know there is a massive piece of work going on about this. Thank you. I think. Um... Andrew. Yes, yeah, thanks, Chair. I mean, just to just to sort of provide a bit more context as well. I mean, the you know the the, the trust will be looking all the time at how they develop the site over a period of time and, and what the overall needs are. I mean, I don't think they can really talk to specifics here, and it's not really a matter for this planning application as such, in terms of the application has to sit on its on its um, what should say in face effectively, and we've we've done that and assessed that. In terms of the overall transport point, I mean, for many a year of sitting on this committee, Councillor Altaf Khan, you'd have sat on many a committee with us and myself talking about, um, you know, hospital related developments. The issue of transport and how that's managed is a complex, complex um, situation, which, you know, there are obviously conversations going on um, with the trust and the county council about how we how that gets managed. But it, again, that's a broader conversation to be having, a more strategic conversation to be had, rather than being isolated just into this application. But so I don't think anyone can give you any comment on whether there's any master plan coming forward or what that would be, and it's not necessarily related to this, relevant to this application, essentially. Yes, but yes, briefly. If, the if problem it's here, this the problem here is very obvious that we deal individual small bits of applications and leave the bigger problems. And I know there are broader issues and broader uh, problems, but if they are not dealt, we can't dealt with these applications and then uh, is often sort of passed on, this is between trust and county. I think, is, is county. there a question so, in this, Councillor? So Council what, what, what so are the solution the trust wanted to deal with this, uh, with the, this when they're putting each application? Do they have any sort of a backing 
uh, that I understand the consultation process uh, is being said, but what are the solution for the overhaul or they just keep putting one application and we deal with the application, deal with that? With all due respect, I think that is a broader question and what we have in front of us is one specific application which we, which we have to determine tonight. Okay, thank you. Councillor, I'm oh, sorry. I just wanted to add to that, but the um, overall framework transport strategy is the is the hospital's overall strategy for transport. And as I said, uh, it, what it will do is capture this current application, but future uh, capital projects that they do. Um, and as uh, the doctor has said, um, they have started the process and asked their staff how they travel, but this is the beginning of, of this um, action, a wider piece, and they understand that they need to uh, up their game. Uh, you know, they are the leaders in the healthcare profession and obviously, you know, well-being and sustainable travel and, you know, becoming healthy by traveling, walking and cycling, et cetera, is part and parcel of that. And they are aware of that and they have their own um, uh carbon and transport net zero targets to, to meet now as part of the Oxford Energy NHS Trust. And so that's why we have conditioned the framework transport strategy to make sure that the hospital do that. They've uh, committed to us that they are going to do that and it, it will be a site wide um, dealing with transport for the hospital moving forward. So I hope that gives you some comfort. Um, I've got um, Councillor Malik, uh, Councillor Upton, and then Councillor Chapman. Okay, thanks, oh. Councillor. Uh, thank you. So it it's um, it's it's about the transport again. I mean, I, I quite agree with the objectors' frustrations about the hospital's parking strategy up to now, which has been pretty horrific, and we all know the. Um, traffic issues around the hospital on particular on clinic days etc um but i just want to um please, perhaps you can just confirm the the very specific mention of the eastern arc bus route that the contribution will go to that um is that's very specifically something that was only ever promised to be delivered once the traffic filters go in which hopefully is at the end of this year so we're talking about that, that's why it hasn't been delivered up to now so that's right isn't it so that's very specific it would be a contribution to that uh, that that new bus route, which is going to be one of the benefits of the traffic filters when they come in, is that yeah, right? Yes, that's right. the The traffic filters are coming in at autumn, or planned autumn, twenty twenty four, and yes. So this is part of the overall um, phase phases that the county have have got proposed for the Eastern Arc. Um, so the bus route would run from the north and it would pick up the park and rides. So I'm buses. I think mm. there's a load of different buses from the north of Oxford, Kidlington, down to uh, Oxford North, for example, mm -hmm. round the east to Thornhill, pick up the Headington area, and then it will also go all the way down to Kid uh, to Cowley and Littlemore, which is an important, and round to Redbridge as well. So it's quite a, uh, the plan, the route isn't you know, <coughs> exactly dotted and nice, you know, um, planned out yet. Mm -hmm. It could move, but that's the idea. It will be the whole of the Eastern Arc. So, in terms of staff for the hospital, it means that a you know wider range of staff coming from all directions on the east could use park and rides and get on the bus and get into the hospital quicker. So it's an important contribution towards that that um, mitigation towards this development. Thank you. Um, yeah, I want to pursue the, the transport issue. When you say, firstly, that that, that it's it's conditioned around having this transport strategy study is that a formal relationship then between this app planning application and that strategy so we're saying to the hospital trust if we approve this you need to do this transport strategy or is it purely based on goodwill and they could you know that they want to do it that's fine but there's no obligation on them to do it i just want to try to understand the strength of the condition here um it is a condition so they will have to do it um, and uh, comply with the, the wording, which is at um, condition um, five, I think it is, sorry, I've written, written it down. Yeah, condition five. Um, so that's the wider transport strategy. But um, so, yes, we, they would have to. 
um, comply with it within the wording that, and we could tighten up the wording following co committee. Um, but the idea is that, it, you know, we can enforce against them if they don't, which they're here and I know they will. So, um, because and um, but also we've got a suite of conditions there as well plans we've got an extra travel plan as well um, which is uh, a more immediate effect so the friends the framework strategy is going to take a slightly longer time to to to, to do and come in but the travel plan is more immediate then you've got a car park management plan which deals with the immediate effect of the displacement of the car parking and how they're going to manage the eligibility for the um, car parking permits and make sure that extra staff don't just rock up. So that's a uh, condition there to secure that element. And, um, and so, and then cycle parking and the contribution. So the suite of uh, conditions there will. Okay. okay. Um, I mean, I suppose, yeah, so, well, well, I, I'm, maybe we're getting into comment territory, so I'll wait till we get to, to, to that. Councillor Raymond. Yeah, um, following on from the master plan suggestion, um, do we have a policy where we look at the size of the site, like if it was an employment site? I know this is not just an employment site, obviously, because it because of the um, patients to go. Do we have any size management plan where we think a size of this site, a site of this size, how many um, car parking? space would be the maximum that we could allow this site or something like that? Or do we have, yeah, do we have a policy like that at all? And we, we don't have a maximum policy, no, but obviously we have car parking standards and it's really about, um, and uh, uh, it's about development, meeting those standards and uh, looking at the site as a whole, but clearly as the local plan moves forward, then, you know, um, we we're assess, reassessing all the parking, you know, parking standards for developments. Um, I don't think we'd ever say a maximum of number of spaces would be allowed on a certain site, but it's, it's sort of erring more into local plan policy and policy allocation rather than this. So, so. follow up. Can I follow? Up? Yeah. So so you know the parking spaces allotted to this potential um, planning application was that in isolation to this building or to the whole site? So the parking spaces that get retained here, on as you can see on the plan at the back, are disabled spaces and, and visitor drop-off. So really, I mean, I'm sure the hospital would say that anyone could use those spaces if they wanted to, but the drop-off really facilitates people for this for, for coming in for surgery here rather than anywhere else. But um, it would be up to the hospital to manage how, manage them, if you see what I mean, which we would do through the management plan condition. Thank you. Uh, Nigel, you're This, is, this is a question to the to hospital's trust, if I may. Um, I mean, obviously, there's a series of trade-offs going on here. And one of the things, one of the risks, it seems to me, is that you reduce the number of staff parking spaces in order to make sure the number of visitor spaces is maintained. That's very clear. Have you done any sort of thinking or risk assessment about the, the risk you run of not attracting enough staff to do this particular set of work by reducing staff car parking? I mean, you run a series of large series of vacancies already in the trust, as far as I remember. So this will there's another 174 jobs on top. Have you have you thought about that? I'd just like to get some assurance, really, that you know, in that trade-off, you've thought about this because it's quite important because we want to have a fully fledged staff NHS at the end of the day, able to do this. And it may not be a planning issue mm. time, but I still want to ask the question. Okay. So, so could you answer, please? So, yeah, I'm quite happy to answer that. So we have considered all of those things. I think it's important for us as part of the process that we have to make sure that framework travel and transport strategy that we're putting together, that we're engaging, and we are doing that right now, as been explained earlier in terms of our staff survey and consultation. So we are out to consultation right now and engagement to absolutely understand our staff needs in terms of parking, in terms of travel and transport to site, and with our wider partners, with local authority, um, the, both the universities and further afield. So... We're really working hard to ascertain the intelligence and data behind how our staff need and want to use and access and egress our sites. That data is going to be really, really important and help feed our 
travel and transport strategy and site plans in terms of how we do this. We have our own sustainability agenda and green plan. We are mandated by the NHS mm. to adhere yeah. to certain requirements in terms of car parking yeah. and sustainability to achieve net zero by 2040, for example. So we have a whole mandated set of governance and requirements within the NHS to meet. So we're absolutely working hard, dare I say flat out, with all the engagements and staff consultation to understand that. And we're embedding what we'd like to see is modal shift to try and use more sustainable methods and modes of transport. But first of all, we need to understand this from our staff to then be able to consider to be able to implement this in a much better and cohesive way to ensure that we're providing the best and fit for purpose solutions across the piece, which will include staff retention. That has to be a major part and component of uh, making sure we're providing you know, a fit for purpose um, site, if you want, for all of those considerations. Thank you. Um, can I just remind um, anybody who's speaking to turn their microphone on when they're speaking and then turn it off um, when they're not, so that people on the live screen can, can hear? Thank you. Are there any other questions or are we moving into... I feel we're moving into comments now. Who wants to... Um, should they go back to their seats now? Yeah. Oh, yes, and could you just go back to your seats now while we... Thank you. Thank you all. Yeah, OK. Um, Councillor Altaf Khan. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, I would make a few comments. Um, first, we all recognise the need and demand and uh, a hospital having on doorstep and the facilities they provide. There's uh, no question about it. If this facility wasn't in place, the knee replacement wouldn't have been walked to town hall today. And there are so many other people affected. Is over hospital. We use it. We walk it. We go nearby. Some people live very nearby. I don't live far away from it. Um, the problem, what is the local neighborhood pick up? That's the, that's the issue we need to deal with. It often becomes a very... Uh, difficult to deal or address those issues because this is one application coming. And I had heard and I served in the past in county, county say the city is the planning authority. They should have dealt with the planning application. Planning would say this is the county. The county should have worked with it. And the John Radcliffe Hospital and NHS Trust itself is a, is a large or big organization. And therefore, I do expect, and I have said this in the past, this is not my first uh, comment or on their application, that there need to be a master plan. There need to be a proper transport strategy so that their documents back up their each application like the application we are, are looking into this. So those documents back up, this is the bigger and broader picture, we will deal with it. So. What is there left with, we, we got one application here. We can't ask this, we can't go this way, we can't go that way because they are the broader questions. So that means either we are just sitting here and not doing anything or we just oppose it or we just support it and then pick up the issues from the local neighborhood. So this is a very much of a dilemma uh, I face whenever I come here. Uh, looking at the specific, this building or structure in the planning terms, I would say that they, they have very little uh, objection to it. But the, if you look at the other pictures surrounding it, there are obviously things which will come back. And as we are a local council, we are not a, a, a technician planners or the uh, clinical people. We are uh, here, we represent people, we pick up the issues surrounding the place. And as I said, this place, we all love it. We all wanted to succeed. We all want the hospital to have a, a proper need and demand facilities there. And I recognize that the people come far away. I've been told people coming even from Bristol to Oxford. So we are in a way lucky to have this facility, but there are some issues which are, could be, we, we can say, or the officer can say that they are broader uh, as we assessing this application, but I have very much a big reservation on, on each time application comes. And I'm sure in a broader term, the officers can 
pass this on back to the organization and try to the county and city and try to say these all, they need to come together to have a proper documentation strategies and the master plan to deal with the issues. So if we just leave as, as things they are, as I think Felicity said, the process started on the transport um, strategy. So it's good to hear that, but you know, how long we are here for and how long this hospital we, business, yeah, business we... is going. So then I think uh, is we need to have a bit more confidence that there will be some other stuffs coming in if there are any other applications. But on this applications, again, I have some reservation. I understand that. And I, and, and I think um, both um, the Trust and also Felicity as our case officer have made it clear that there have been intense conversations. And, and as, as a long-standing council for the area, I'm perfectly aware there have been things like Hamats have been accessed to Headington over the years. Things change. You know, Hamats perhaps was fit for purpose at the time, but then more services were focused on the John Radcliffe rather than on some of the county hospitals and things had to be reviewed again. So it's always going to be a fairly dynamic picture and the two and planning applications aren't always in sync with the transport things. But you know, I, I, I'm rest assured that both the Highways Authority and, and the City Council's Planning Authority are working with with um, with the hospital trusts on this. But I think now we have to make a decision on the planning application before us, regarding regardless of any master plan that we that we may have. Yes, thank you for your comments. And as you do know, that I am also a very old, long stock, and I, I go back to the hammocks and all those things so and i live in the area for a number of decades uh, councillor malik thank you chair uh, i think nhs does a perfect job i'm a taxi driver so i pick up people far as coming from isle of man isle of white god knows where to attend different hospital appointments either the nuffield or jr etc uh, which not just make me proud or feel privileged to live in the city, which facilities on my doorstep. But I think what Councillor Khan just said, and there are two different things. We all councillor, we have a responsibility. And I think what these things need to be picked up in our local plans, and our local plan should address these issues, because if you look at the history of Fox, we used to have a Radcliffe infirmary. So that trust, then become academic side, then all the ENT department goes on to the one side. And broader, I mean, I appreciate these are not planning things, but when you plan for the city and what plan you have had 30, 40 years and local plan comes up, and no disrespect, when I look back, sometimes I see very bad planning into the city. And these are my own personal views, the way things have planned. And officer gets drawn into what the law says because planning is a law and they have to follow the guideline. But equally, as a council, we have a responsibility how our city will thrive and how these people can commute into work and the patient. And there was mention of the bus filters. Bus filters are going to do nothing to JR traffic. The real traffic comes from Marsh. Can we can we restrict that? Yeah, debate? no, because that, I don't know if it's I, it's specifically related to this well, planning it, it application. It is it's because important. it was it was mentioned here in the officer report. And due respect to you, chair, I am entitled to my views, and we are having a basically debate. So if I just may finish, I'll finish very quickly. But these are relevant because officer mentioned a the objector mentioned a then is. I mean, we tell people that these things are coming and it's going to improve. But in ground reality, like I said, I'm a taxi driver. I go to JR probably every morning. And the traffic you have, is anybody ever, due respect, yeah, it's not relevant, but half three, four o'clock can take you 40 minutes, half an hour to get out of the hospital on, on certain days. So the, these things we need to look apart from these planning applications. And when we do our... Uh, local plan and the other things, so the officers can go along. But however, but I, I, I don't have any planning objection on the application, so, but I'm entitled to my comments. So these are my comments. So equally, as a, as a local authority, what we need to look into a broader picture, have a, a, all the political groups need to contribute, how our city move forward, how we people 
get across. And equally, when you talk about uh, university trust and the hospital, they do need a master plan. They need to come out with the ideas. They need to invest in the, in, uh, in the transport system where on the park and ride another, their staff can park and they have to commute them in. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councillor Raymond. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, it's good to see that um, they've got a plan to use the park and ride which is going to be really helpful. I think lots of, have been, lots of us have been saying that for a long time. Um, and it's good they invested £170,000 in the bus route, but, I mean, £170,000 is not going to go very far on that route, I'm afraid. It's probably not going to be enough to cover it for a year, but um, that's not for the trust. Um, against that, we've got all these waiting lists that two years, two years, three years, when they should be 18 weeks and stuff. Um, and we're privileged to have that. So, I you know, my opinion is that, um, or my comment is that there are traffic issues. I think that's the biggest issue to this um, sort of expanding of the uh, NHS site. However, the the benefits that are obvious to see to for everybody um, in this in this instance far outweigh. I think so. I, in that case, for that reason, I'll be supporting this application. Thank you. Um, Councillor Chapman. Well, I'd like to move approval formally because I, I, we've had a, you know, a sensible debate about the pros and cons of this application and it all comes around to the issue of public benefits in the end, as it so often does, and how you weigh those up. Uh, and um, you know, I'm struck by the very large number of people who are waiting for operations, the day-to-day -day pain and suffering that they're in, which would be considerable, uh, and you have to weigh that up against the irritation and the inconvenience that some people will face with potentially higher traffic levels, people parking near their house in the CPZ and where they shouldn't be, which is an issue I particularly want to flag because as the local councillor, I see that going on all the time and it's very often very poorly policed. But those are irritations. They're not matters of life and death. You know, not having an operation in time can lead to the end of your life. And it can lead to very, very poor quality of life. And so therefore, for me, on the, on the weighing the, the balance of all of this, irrespective of the pure planning issues, the case for this is very, very strong. And then when you look at the planning issues as, alongside it, there are no real reasons not to approve it. I mean, you know, it meets the planning needs. It, 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 you know, it meets the requirement. It's been thoroughly put together by the planning officer in conjunction with the University Trust. And therefore... There are no grounds to reject it, and therefore, I'm not, for all those reasons, for the public good reasons, for the balance of public good, and for planning grounds, I will be supporting it, and I propose we, I move acceptance with the conditions okay. as outlined. Thank you. I've got the one six and, and the one oh six. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Councillor Upton, and then um, yeah, okay. Yeah, I, I'd just like to to second that. I think for the eighty thousand people who are on the waiting list, we need this to happen um, as. Uh, as Councillor Chapman has outlined, it conforms with all our planning policies. So I don't think there's any reason to turn it down. And I think I'm very glad the NHS Trust are here. And I think they'll have heard very loudly and clearly that our massive concern is around the transport. Yeah. So we, we are counting on them to really get on top of that with the active travel, public transport, um, take up of their staff, hopefully patients. But second it uh, including all of the section 106 and all of the uh, conditions please do i see any additional comments at this stage can can i just add one 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 thing it's um referred to in paragraph 10.39 um which is about briam standards and i think it's suggested that that might be added um it says ex um, briam excellent could be secured by condition I'd like us to add that if that is possible, add, adding that in as a condition. So it's, yeah, it's paragraph 1039 on page 38 of the report. If, if committee are supportive of adding that on, that's in. Stop. Sorry, could I add it's, it's in condition 14? 1064. 1064. Sorry. Uh, yes, no, it's it, within the wording of the sustainable design condition, condition 14, it says uh, just to, it's within there, it says the energy strategy and evidence of attainment of the Brian Excellence Standards in that condition. Okay. Thank you, sorry about that. Okay, so we have a proposal um, on the table 
um, to support the officer's recommendation together with all the conditions. Um, can I see all those in favour of approving this application? Eight. Uh, do I see anybody opposed to this? And abstentions. Okay. So that is that is carried. Um, can we have a brief break now um, before we move on to the second application? Thank you.
move on to um, item number four. So if you could sit down, please, while, um, while we um, begin the officer's presentation. Beforehand, um, Councillor Douglas, I want, um, since you, you weren't here for the, for the beginning of the committee, I wonder if you could, um, I'll give you the opportunity to say whether you have any declarations of interest. Thank you, and apologies, I was late. I did actually have an interest in the first one, so I have an honorary contract with the Trust, um, but also uh, I objected to item number five. Hmm. And so I assume you will be leaving the room. Thank you. Okay. Um, can we move on, therefore, to agenda item four and over to Sarah to present it. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I'm just going to start with a verbal update. Um, since the publication of the report, I have received three additional objections from residents in South Street, Western Road, and a letter received on behalf of a number of residents where the specific addresses weren't um, disclosed. Most of the issues raised have already been addressed in the committee report, but notwithstanding this, I'll go through the points. Um, first one, they disagree with my assessment of the impact of the bridge in its setting and the bridge will radically change the character of the nature reserve. Um, on that point, officers have assessed the impact of the bridge on the local area and found it to be acceptable. The bridge has been designed to minimise its impact on the site and this is set out in the report. In addition, Natural England have also commented and stated that the proposed development will not have a significant adverse impact. Uh, the points that were raised that there is another bridge located to where this one is proposed there's an objection to the towpath being promoted to a main cycle route and the conflict between cyclists and pedestrians and uh, the fact that there is already a bottleneck under the railway bridge and this area floods um, the report sets out that the other bridges were looked at but not deemed to fulfil the requirements of the proposed bridge um, due to needing extensive works to make them suitable for cyclists. The path upgrades would be designed to be suitable for a cycle route and the County Council would be the lead authority in determining whether it could be, would be formally designated as the main cycle way. Bottleneck issues um, are considered in the report, and this sets out that there is research that shows that cyclists adjust their speed depending on the density of pedestrians. Um, the County Council have been consulted on the application and raised no objection to the shared use of the path or the bridge. Another comment that was received um, relates to, uh, the, to whether the development is EIA development. Officers have screened the development and do not consider the development to be EIA development. Another point that was raised uh, relates to the sequential and exception test. So I just want to clarify this because it isn't set out in the report. Officers agree with the sequential and exception test set out in the submitted flood risk assessment. Officers consider the development essential infrastructure and that this type of development is acceptable in flood zone 3B. Notwithstanding this, the sequential and exception test will still need to be met. With regard to the bridge, policy SP1 and SP2 sets out that a new cycle and pedestrian bridge over the river should be delivered in this location to link and enhance routes to the city centre. The aspiration for a new bridge over a watercourse would in itself be required to cross an area of high risk to flooding. The local plan and West End SPD sets out that this area should be the location of the bridge. Officers therefore considered the sequential test has been met. If a development cannot be located, located in an area of lower flood risk, an, an exception test should be carried out. Paragraph 170 of the MPPF sets out, uh, to pass the exception test, it should be demonstrated that A, the development would provide wider sustainability benefits to the community that outweigh the flood risk, and B, the, the development will be safe for its lifetime, taking in taking account of the vulnerability of its users without increasing flood risk elsewhere, and where possible, will, will reduce flood risk overall. Both elements of the exception test should be satisfied for the development to be allocated or permitted. The application sets out that the, app, that the proposal would bring with it wider sustainability benefits by providing a route that improves cycle and pedestrian connectivity to the city centre, as well as the, the surrounding allocated sites. In addition, the application is supported with an FRA that demonstrates that the development would not increase flood risk. Officers therefore consider that the exception test has been met. Another issue that has been raised was uh, 
regarding the consultation and advertisement of the application. So it's set out in the report, but site notices were put up surrounding the development site in November and advert was also went into the local newspaper advertising the development. Um, another point that's been raised is that the trees have been removed prior to determination. Um, as set out in the officer report, um, we are aware that the trees have been removed, but as they were not as they're not located in a conservation area and are not subject to the TPO, planning permission isn't required for their removal. Um, in, in addition to those, there are two further SUDS conditions that haven't been included in the list of conditions that, um, that we would like to add uh, relating to SUDS, and they essentially require details of the submitted, um, require details relating to surface water drainage um, as sought by the County Council. Right, so I'll move on now. So the application seeks planning permission for a new cycle and pedestrian bridge over the Thames from Grand Pont to Oxpens Meadows. The, bread, the bridge would have a steel structure and would span 98.90 metres with a river span of 23.39 metres. The bridge will have a deck width of 3.5 metres. In addition, the proposal seeks to improve the adjoining footpath. On the north side, the bridge will link to the existing footpath leading up to the Oxpens Road. On the south side, the pathworks will seek to improve the gradient of the path inside the application boundary. The footpaths will also be widened. The bridge has been designed to respond to its setting. The bridge will feature a slender deck and curved soffits to maximise the transparency of the bridge on the site. The asymmetrical structural waves in the design has been designed to direct and guide views. The bridge will be steel with concrete piers. Officers consider that the bridge responds positively to the character of the site and its context. With regard to the impact on neighbouring amenity, the development is not considered to have an unacceptable impact due to the separation distances. The bridge has been designed to comply with the National Guidance on Design Infrastructure, Infrastructure CD353 design criteria for bridges. There have been no technical objections to the application. To conclude, officers have considered the application to be acceptable in terms of principal design, impact on neighbouring amenity, highways, trees, biodiversity and other issues set out in the report. And therefore... Um, your officers are recommending approval subject to conditions and a section 106 agreement to secure, to secure the BNG offsetting. I'll just run through my presentation now. So here you can see the red line. You can see where the bridge is proposed to be located um, and it crosses over here. There you can see the ice rink and the Oxpens Road. Um, you can see the towpath here and you can see where the um, path seeks to join um, the towpath here. This is a landscape plan. So you can see again here where the uh, route of the bridge will cross over and uh, join up to that path leading onto Oxpens Road. You can also see where there's proposed planting, where's planting to be proposed on the southern side and additional planting here on the northern side. This is just um, a sort of viewed in um, plan showing the North landscape plan. And this is a viewed in one on the South landscape plan where you can see the, um, where the bridge connects onto the towpath and back into the footpath. This is a plan again, showing the bridge layout. And this is the bridge elevation, but I apologise because it's not very clear to see here. This is a section showing with the piers and the width of the bridge. And here are the details of the materials. You can see here um, the, the, the fact that it's going to be steel and it's going to be uh, of a dark grey and light grey. Here are some visu visualizations that were provided with the application. So this is what the view will be from Grand Pont approaching the bridge. This is a visualization from uh, the towpath on the meadow side. And this is one from the Oxpens Road where you can see the bridge. Mm -hmm. And these are just some photographs that I've taken of the site. So this is the existing view from Oxpens Road. 
And here you can see where the trees were taken down, and this is taken from Oxfam's Meadows. Another view from the northern side. Another one. And here is a view from the towpath on the southern side. And here are small visualizations of the bridge. Thank you, Chair. That's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Now we have um, five people who wish to speak against the application. If you could come forward, you have a total of five minutes to speak. Um, with so many of you, I understand you might overrun, and if you do so, I'm willing to consider a, a, a short extension. But that will also mean that the three speakers who are going to be speaking in favour will be given exactly the same amount of time. OK, thank you. So when you are ready, um, we'll start the, the timer. Thank you. Sorry, if you could use the um, microphone, I'll turn mine off and then you'll... OK. I'm actually, um, there were only four. <clears throat> My mother, who's 83, uh, had a hospital appointment this morning, so she can't make it, but she's provided a statement. Um, she's lived in Grand Pont since the early 70s, and this is her statement. I'm opposing this planning application on the grounds of loss of neighbouring amenity, see policy RE7 of the Oxford Local Plan. Neighbouring amenity was cursorily referred to in the planning statement, but only in so far as it related to neighbouring properties. What was completely left out was the impact on us, the local residents, the people who actually use and love Grand Pont Nature Park. This place is so important. We have a little bit of countryside here on our doorstep. We don't have to get in a car. We can walk to it from home. It's where we go to restore our sanity. It's part of our well-being. One day when we were tree guarding, we counted over 500 people on a favourite stretch of the path where there are trees on either side and you can feel you're in a wood. This is the part of the, that will be destroyed almost entirely by the bridge. There were dog walkers, families with children, people, quite a few elderly like me, all just happy to be out enjoying nature in a relaxed and peaceful way. The Oxpens Bridge would put an end to all this. The trees would nearly all go, the paths would be widened to twice their present width, the little hill flattened and the surfaces asphalted. The balance between pedestrians and cyclists would be changed. We'd be left with a straight, wide, treeless cycle track, totally unsuitable for walkers out for their constitutional stroll. The destruction of this area is very personal to me. I've watched it grow from poison gas works ground to a haven for nature. I'm heartbroken to see Grand Pont Nature Park being demoted to a fast urban cycleway. End of statement. So users of the nature reserve are devastated by what is being proposed. Almost an entire copse of ash trees will be destroyed. You can see it over here. The only piece of woodland on a three mile stretch between Ifley and Osney, stretch of path between Ifley and Osney. Most of the 10 million pound cost of the bridge is to come out of the Oxfordshire growth deal, money that's supposed to facilitate the building of new homes and whose purpose is to, quote, ensure that people can live in affordable homes. Yet the bridge will not facilitate a single affordable home. We believe this is a flagrant, indeed fraudulent, abuse of this fund and we urge councillors not, not to be a party to it. Finally, I want to alert councillors to a recent Court of Appeal ruling overturning planning permission for a bridge in Tewkesbury on the grounds that the committee had failed to take into account the environmental impact of future developments facilitated by the bridge. The Oxpens Bridge is explicitly designed to facilitate development at Osney Mead, yet no assessment has been made of the impact of this future development. We believe this illustrates both recklessness and lawlessness, and we will be taking legal action should the committee today ignore that. Thank you. Just two minutes away from the planned bridge is the majestic cast iron bridge built in 1886 for the long demolished gas works. The piers are sunk 20 feet into the riverbed and it is crucially wide enough to reuse for pedestrians and cyclists. Good planning in sensitive areas such as this should be about reuse, regeneration and minimising CO2. So how has this alternative not been costed and in a city that purports to value heritage and the environment. Reuse has been dismissed in favour of destroying a nature park and the reckless use of new steel and concrete. Surely good practice would be to do a carbon comparison of the new bridge alongside reuse of the old one, especially when our irony of ironies, 
This whole scheme is part of a zero carbon initiative. Thank you. Um, firstly, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. I've been engaging with issues concerning this city for over 30 years. You've passed many laudable policies during that time concerning inclusive consultation, putting housing front and centre in the local plan, committing to zero carbon, etc. And yet here we are still trying to get you, our elected representatives, to live up to those commitments because this bridge proposal flies in the face of them. It wasn't consulted on in the formative stages, a requirement in law. It will destroy this much loved nature park and mature trees can't be replaced. The park belongs to Oxford residents. It's kept by you in care for us. It's contrary to national planning policy. Don't build new if retrofit is an option and you've not proven it isn't with the Gasworks Bridge. And it's only required in the local plan so that the go-ahead can be given to develop Osney Mead in the floodplain and then evacuate its residents and employees when they're flooded. We urge you to do the right and courageous thing for the sake of public benefit and refuse to pursue this nonsensical bridge. I should have asked you at the beginning, don't, um, and this isn't going to count as 45 minutes, um, just to give your names and explain who you are very briefly. So I'll allow you to do that. I know who most of you are, but I'll let you do that um, and, then, and then continue. Thank you. Uh, Deborah Glasswoodin, former city councillor, um, and desperately upset to be doing this yet again after all these years when we should do better. Um, councillor Lois Muddiman, councillor for Osney and St Thomas Ward. I'm Jo Newson. Sorry, thanks. I'm Jo Newson. I've worked in heritage um, in various positions, and uh, but primarily I'm speaking as a local resident, and I know and love the area. Um, and Dan Glazebrook, uh, teacher and writer, um, born and raised in Grand Pont. Thank you. I'll continue. Um, firstly, I assume councillors have already read the solicitor's letter that you were sent laying out the material planning grounds for rejecting this application, which included the lack of content and the date of the environmental impact assessment screening opinion, the fact that the EA requires a sequential test because it's in the flood zone um, two and three, as the national policy um, planning policy framework para 168, there's no evidence of this. Three, the lack of consultation. Only one group in South Oxford were consulted and none in Osney and St Thomas. And fourthly, the appearance of predetermination because of the felling of the trees before planning application was granted. Um, the City Council is building this bridge with £10 million of public funds to support the university's plans to develop Osney Mead. As you know, creating employment sites such as Osney Mead and Oxpens without building enough new homes for those workers means demand goes up, house prices goes up, and Oxford becomes an even more unaffordable place to live. If this bridge was linking two developments packed with affordable homes for local people, then the public good might outweigh the waste. But that is not the case here. The funding from the county has already been diverted once from a scheme in North Oxford. Perhaps under a new administration in the future, we could divert the funding again maybe to a new bridge over the Thames off Ifley Road, which could help East Oxford cyclists avoid the plain roundabout. Thank you. Thank you. Now, there isn't really enough room for everyone to sit down, so I'm afraid if you can go and sit back where you were and um, those speaking in favour can come forward, but we may call you forward again um, if members of the committee have any questions. Yeah. Thanks. And you have seven minutes between you, so that makes it um, exactly the same, the same as um, the objectors had. Say who you are. Thank you. We won't need seven minutes, but thank you anyway. Paul Comerford, Prime Partners, um, working with City Council and a wider design and consultant team for this application. The proposed bridge represents a key priority 
for the delivery of city infrastructure in a defined area of change that will provide significant public benefit whilst responding to the Oxford local plan. The bridge is integral to the wider plans for the West End of Oxford, including proposals for key development sites established in the West End SPD. Therefore, the bridge's location has been carefully considered, balancing the need for a direct and convenient route, its impact on open spaces, and ensuring it's deliverable. The bridge will provide significantly enhanced connectivity for pedestrians and cyclists between existing communities as well as Osney Mead and Oxpens, to name but two major allocated sites it will serve. This will be an improvement to active travel choices in the area and provide greater resilience in that regard, which will encourage movement away from more unpleasant and unhealthy routes. Through extensive public and stakeholder engagement at the early stages of its development and design, Together with the Oxford Design Review Panel, the design has evolved whilst retaining its form using asymmetrical waves that support the bridge and allow the desired transparency in the centre of the span that responds to the landscape, celebrates city and river views and will provide enjoyment to users. The bridge will be a slender and elegant addition to the area and as officers have confirmed, it will sit comfortably in its setting, which has provided the inspiration for its design. On materials, the choices have been developed with the county in terms of sustainability, functionality, design and management. In terms of the landscaping proposals, these include significant new tree planting with a wider variety of native species that will contribute to the legibility of new and existing routes together with tree canopy gain. I should say there has been coordination with the Oxpen development proposals, which has been maintained throughout the design of the bridge throughout that process, particularly with regard to landscaping, archaeology and flooding, resulting in less bridge supports and providing clear connections between planned new open spaces and the meadows. The intention is to co coordinate implementation to reduce disruption as far as possible. In conclusion, the proposal is a policy driven, policy compliant project, and we clearly support the officer's recommendation for approval, thank them for their inputs into the design and pro planning process to date. Hand over to Councillor Relton. Uh, thank you very much. So, yes, I am Councillor Anna Railton. I'm the ward member for Hinksy Park, which is the land south of this bridge and the cabinet member for Zero Carbon Oxford. So I think um, this planning application is very much um, sort of upholds the sort of, you know, perfect not being enemy of good. You know, there are things here that are not ideal. You know, the width is not ideal. The fact it's three and a half metres instead of four metres. Um, the routing with respect to Osney Mead is not perfect. The tree removal required for it to be built is not perfect either. But I mean, you know, there are, there are a lot of things to be said in its favour. You know, getting infrastructure in before it's needed almost never happens in this country. We're always on the back foot with it. And it's actually um, amazing to see something coming forward um, in, you know, in this case, in this sequence. Um, it's, you know, it's funding for sustainable active travel. Um, you know, this also doesn't come forward a huge amount either. We get a lot of money um, printed out for uh, new roads, much less for new cycling and walking infrastructure. Um, and, you know, getting funding for this will be more difficult if we reject compliance schemes such as this. Um, you know, it has been well designed. You know, earlier iterations of this were like literally, you know, box girders plonked across the river. And this is much more elegant um, um, and in keeping with the rest of the site. Um, you know, it does unlock housing on, on, on Osney Mead and gives those residents active travel choices into town. You know, graduate postdoc staff housing on Osney Mead you know, this housing is still housing and will bring public benefits to Oxford and will help alleviate its housing crisis. Um, this bridge as well will offer a more pleasant and direct route to the station for residents in South Oxford and to the city centre from West Oxford. Finally, um, this is a good scheme. Its funding will not be spent in Oxford if, it's, if it is not spent here, if the application is rejected and the housing in Austin Mead will be at risk if it does not go ahead. Thank you. Thank you.
think if now move into questions, if you could go and sit down um, and we'll call you if there are any questions specifically for you. Thank you. Okay, I see um, Councillor Mundy, Councillor Fowler, that, oh, four, okay. Um, um, Councillor Mundy and then Councillor Fowler, and I've got you both. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah. So this question's for um, the the proposers, the architects and uh, and officers. Um, so obviously it's been referred to by the objectors, the presence of the gasworks bridge that's already near to the site. And, and my question is why that hadn't been considered as a logical alternative to building what is obviously a, a substantial new uh, uh, bridge with with a lot of materials being used when that could have been potentially cheaper and a, and a lower impact ecologically um, and uh, on, on the green space of the area. The bridge is obviously quite close by. Uh, the Gasworks Bridge could quite logically link up with National Cycle Route 5. Um, it's close to the Friars Wharf Estate, um, where obviously the, the residents of Friars Wharf Estate have been waiting three years to have their own Grand Pont Bridge reopened uh, after it's closed. So it, it does confuse me why this is, is the priority. Um, uh, also, uh, there is also referred to in, in comments um, about the width of the path under the railway bridge to the south of the site. So there's obviously, uh, an, you know, there's obviously a, a name to increase the capacity of, of, uh, of cycle and pedestrian traffic over the river at that point. I just don't see how that part of the path that goes under the railway bridge uh, next to the river, I can't see how that could take additional capacity of of both pedestrians and cyclists. And I, I don't quite see how, with, with the river where it is, and obviously it being an immovable object of the railway bridge, I don't see where where the plan uh, sort of allows allows for that. Um, so those are sort of my main comments about it. Um, so thank you for that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the report sets out um, and talks about the Gasworks Rail Bridge in 10.6. Um, their application, the gas work, improvements to the Gasworks Bridge was considered um, as an alternative route, but there were a number of upgrades that would be required in terms of um, making it suitable for cyclists, such as raising the parapets, looking at the levels as you come off the bridge, and obviously in terms of then going on to the, through the meadows, that area does flood. Um, so, there were, so there are a number of issues with using that bridge um, for cyclists. Um, in terms of the width of the path under the bridge, obviously um, the red line essentially does stop just before that. Um, and they are making improvements to that area of path. Um, the local plan does talk about general improvements to um, paths in the vicinity, and obviously in the future, if that comes forward, then, then that would be a benefit. But this scheme isn't looking to um, do work to that path that sort of sits right under the bridge. That answer your question, Councillor Mundy. Not the second one, Sorry. Okay. It didn't really answer my second question, but I've, I've taken the comment on board. I, I, I don't think I've had it answered where how that path could be improved. I appreciate that's not part of the application, but I do think it's relevant because obviously there is the intention of that bridge providing more access for, for active travel users that would inevitably take that path under the, uh, the railway bridge. Yeah. Thank you. Well, Councillor Fowler. Um, I'll pass on this because uh, Councillor Mundy's actually asked the questions I was intending to ask. Okay, good. Uh, Councillor Altav Khan. Um, the applicant said this is a policy driven. So that means is a political policy set to have this bridge. Is the driven that is not the planning policy driven to this application. So my understanding is this is a political decision to go ahead with this. Then we come to this planning application. Can somebody clarify uh, that? Uh, are we talking about um, a political policies or the planning policies driven here? Thank you. Uh, it's a policy. It's a policy uh, compliance scheme. The local plan and the West End SPD talks about improvements and the delivery of a bridge in this location. So. 
this has been in this local plan. I think it was in the last local plan. So it's um, it's definitely something that's been ingrained in policy in terms of bringing and improving connectivity to the city centre. Thank you. Um, Councillor Malik. Councillor Raymond. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, so you said that um, the, you know, the improvement to the gas works bridge um, was uh, evaluated. Do you know the cost or was there cost um, analysis done? Because I think this bridge that you mentioned is going to cost, or somebody mentioned is going to cost £10 million. Um, it doesn't matter where the money's coming from, but I'm just wondering if you have a cost analysis for the gas works bridge. I, I, I couldn't comment on the cost analysis. That would be for the applicant to, to comment on and what, what work's been done on that. The point I think that, that has been made in the officer's report and obviously came through in the county council's response was that the gas works bridge wasn't seen to be uh, a suitable alternative in terms of delivering a, 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 a link that would provide for the pedestrian cycle crossings that, you, that, that we would anticipate coming from this. The point of of this is that there are limitations to that gasworks bridge in terms of how that drops down into the meadow, which floods, so that has an impact on usability of the bridge. And what this does is it takes it out of the flood zone, so therefore the usability will be greater over a longer period of time. So that's what that's been. That's partly the reason in terms of that, that have been looked at for why the gasworks bridge wasn't looked at as a suitable alternative. Um, the applicant can confirm what cost and benefit analysis has been done. But again, that isn't essentially a matter for the planning uh, decision that you've got before you today. Um, question, questions that need to be addressed to, through the chair, please, and, and from the committee as well. Chair, I will answer that point. I think it's important. The point is they go to the same meadow, but the bridge that's currently put forward to you now is the, the pathway and the route from the bridge is raised above the flood zone. So that's the point that we're talking about, whereas the other bridge drops down into the meadow, which is not, and the route from the from the existing bridge down through the meadow is not out of the flood zone. So there is that's the difference that we're talking about. Thank you. Thank you for clarifying. Questions? Um, Councillor Corries. Okay, uh, good evening. Uh, my question is related about the, um, the, st the statutory consultation about the Times Valley policy. It raises uh, two or three uh, issues about safety, uh, about the lightings, and SSTV. This will be addressed or not? Uh, I will say the paragraph is 8.8, 8.9, 8.10. Hi, yes, so um, yes, so the, the Thames Valley Police did comment on the application. In terms of lighting, uh, I received comments both for and against lighting. There are issues with lighting the bridge in terms of the impact on um, ecology. In addition, there has to be, you have to have a uh, consider what lighting a bridge will do in terms of essentially people using the bridge thinking it's going to be lit. And then obviously, as you enter onto Grand Pont, the lighting would then stop. So you're, so you have that potentially, or you have it not lit, which is um, beneficial for the ecology. And also people using the bridge are aware that they're going in, in, into an unlit area. So obviously from t Thames Valley Police's point of view, I guess from safety, they're looking at it um, from that, but it has been considered as part of the application. The bridge won't be lit, but there is the potential in the future for it to be lit and it could be retrofitted into the bridge. Um, the other point in terms of safety uh, they raised was the handrails and that people may jump off the bridge. Um, and we understand the concern with that. Um, in itself, um, if people were minded to do that, the exclusion of the handrails probably wouldn't stop them. Um, also, you know, there's good visibility with the bridge, so we're hoping that that will um, limit opportunities for that and also for antisocial behaviour. And about the, C yeah. the, the, the CCTV, the cameras and so on, this is, uh, uh, do you have any plan or...? or... Network. Yeah, so at the moment there's not a plan for CCTV to be included with 
the bridge. Um, again, we're hoping that the visibility of the bridge will help reduce antisocial behaviour. Um, and if that come, you know, if it comes forward in an application in the future, then we can consider it then. But it's not proposed as part of this application. Any other questions that this uh, council out of? Um, I think uh, height was mentioned that this is above the flood plain and it's more height than the other bridge. So what's the difference in height here? So I don't have the all of the measurements, but in terms of, um, say, that from the towpaths, I do have that. So from the northern side, um, it will be 2.6 metres. So you'll be able to sort of walk under it with that. And on the other side, on the southern side, it will be 2.85 metres. So, and as you can see in the sort of images, how it will be raised, and then it will link onto the footpath going up into, um, onto the Oxpens Road. That's fair weather. Um, can I ask the um, planning officer to... Um clarify this business about the environmental impact assessment that was raised by one of the objectives? Yes, yeah, so the application was screened and it wasn't considered to be EIA development um, as it fell under the thresholds. Um, the bridge is a standalone application and it can come forward with or without the allocated sites. So um, the Oxpens development was screened and found to be EIA development that's in um, consideration at the moment, but all sites are looked at individually and the bridge was screened um, and not found to be EIA development. Yeah, Chair, just, just to come in, just to clarify, the, the concern raised was that the that the EIA, uh, the, uh, an environmental impact screening assessment, which is the first stage of considering whether an environmental impact assessment is necessary, was... Uh, Sorry, the first stage of whether an environmental impact assessment is necessary, you do a screening opinion to see if that's needed. And you assess that against a number of uh, criteria and threshold in, in certain set schedules. So it was considered that it would fall within a certain schedule. Um, and what, what we've done then, you then assess it against a number of criteria. And it was considered that, that an environmental impact assessment was not needed because looking at the criteria, it wouldn't give rise to significant environmental impacts over and above what we're normally considered in an application, planning application. So the application before you considers uh, all of the material planning considerations and technical considerations with regards to this planning application. So that matter has been considered. So the concern that the environmental impact assessment hadn't considered those points, we would not agree with because the environment when we did the, the, the environmental screening, it was considered that an EIA was not needed or it wasn't EIA development. And that's that's where we, we are with that. Thank you. Sorry, Sorry, I should say someone's recording the meeting. So if you... Sorry, I understand someone's recording the meeting. Phone up there. Um, if you're, I, did, I did say quite explicitly at the beginning that if anyone wanted to record the meeting, could they please let us know? Anyone recording? Is anyone recording it? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. Yes, I just want to add something on the EIA point. Um, in in re response, really, to something uh, one of the objectors said, um, they I think they were making the point that um, the EIA uh, screening was only carried out in relation to this development, and I think the point was made that it should have considered the Oxpens development, the... Um, Oh, sorry, Osney Mead um, development. Um, and he quoted a case, I think it was the, uh, the Tewkesbury case. Um, in that case, um, it was, I think it can be distinguished because in that case, the bridge, and there was a bridge involved in that case as well, um, it went without the, um, the, the other development, it went to nowhere, it served no purpose. You've heard quite clearly from the planning officer that that's not the case with this bridge. This bridge can go ahead and would go ahead, whether the other developments proceeded or not. And, th and so therefore, there was an, it's a standalone project and it was right that we e screened it on its own and not in relation to the, the um, larger development uh, adjacent to it. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you for clarifying that. 
Do we have any more questions? No. Perhaps we move into discussion. Councillor Malik. Thank you. Thanks for the both parties giving their presentation. I'm still not uh, convinced we need to have this bridge. If you look at the picture now, in my point of view, that destroys the view if you build this bridge. When you already have the bridge, and we've been told, oh, that is currently not uh, viable or goes into floodplain, eventually these both end up in the same place. So I cannot see a difference in my point of view. Why I'm personally annoyed is, I mean, I can understand this is not in a conservation area. Before this planning application with adjournment, the tree has already been chopped up. And this is another, obviously not a planning issue, but this is my comment, we need to look into it. I mean, nothing been decided, but it's like some sort of decision being taken to take the trees off. Um, because of that reason, because the funding won't be used in Oxford or Oxfordshire, that doesn't mean I'm going to destroy my beautiful view of my city. So I am not, as a councillor, we have a responsibility, no matter the funding comes from central government, it is a public funds. And they should be used in a more effective way, where you already been seeing the picture, you already got this gas bridge, and the money, if the city council is so ambitious, they should find some money to improve the bridge, rather than looking the funding to destroy the another view. So on that matter, I won't be voting for it. And if anybody wants to second it, I will remove refusal for this application. Okay, is... Um... Yeah, yeah. You need to say what the reason is. Yeah. You need to give the reasons for and um, for your well, refusal re and, and, re and, and, and give the planning reasons for that. Well, uh, the, the reason uh, we all received a solicitor letter, there are very much specific reasons. And uh, also the mention was there, uh, RE7 local plan, uh, the objector did. And I am sure once the committee come to the um, conclusion and we can add all of that i mean the, the 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 presence of a solicitor's letter is not in itself a reason for refusal we're looking at local plan policies um and that and and making a decision in line with those so but you're saying re7 is your well re7 and is is also basically a loss uh, of the trees and environmental damage because uh, this is also a a, a uh, reason for refusal because impact when you look at it is putting up all the steel and uh, cement on the green side so is a, these are my uh, objections to it is it is there a seconder does anyone want a second refusal councillor mundy okay we've got that on the table um, yeah I, I, well i was going to wait and to see whether i came forward before i respond but i can i mean i mean firstly as as legal have already or council chairs already advised you the, the receipt of the solicitor's letter is not in itself a reason to refuse doesn't actually give you reasons planning material planning reasons why to refuse the application um we could go into that into some detail if you want on some of the specific points that said also in terms of, you've referred to policy RE7 in the local plan, I think you'd have to be specific what specific part of RE7 you actually think this is contrary to. Um, and secondly, in terms of the loss of trees and environmental damage, or well, you're alleging environmental damage um, without, I think you'd need to give some detail as to specifically what policy in the local plan the environmental damage you're referring to relates to, and the loss of the trees Again, the pol we have clear policies about dealing with trees and, and loss of trees in relation to a planning application. As we've told you and said, the issue with the removal of the trees prior to this application obviously is, is a matter for the council as its landowner to deal with. There was no planning permission required for the removal of those trees. They're There's not in a, a license required. That's again. The trees are not in a conservation area. They're not subject to a TPO. So tree preservation order. The license that's being referred to is part of the for is to dealt with by the Forestry Commission. Again, it is not a planning requirement. So you'd have to be clear. So, excuse me. Excuse me. Please, 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 please. Can you please be quiet? This is a public the truth is told in this room. Please the, the committee the committee the committee is debating this now. And if you could let the committee make 
make make their points, please. Again, that is a matter for the Forestry Commission to take up if they would like to enforce against the council for de doing work that anyone thinks they didn't have a licence for. But my understanding is the Forestry Commission have declined to do so and therefore and a licence wasn't required for the work that was oh, undertaken. Sorry. Again, please, it's not a let, planning... Let the officer again, finish. The, the truth of the matter is it's not a planning matter. So... If you're concerned about the loss of trees, then you would need to identify precisely with about the trees that are being removed on the current application, what that, that harm is and what the impact is. That would, those would be reasons for refusal. For the audience, the reason that is important is that as a council and as a local planning authority, you have to determine a planning application. We need to make sure when we are refusing an application that the, the material reasons are related to the planning application and, and planning policy. The National Planning Policy Framework is really clear that local planning authorities should determine applications where they are accord with planning policies without delay and where you've got an up-to-date development plan. And, and so for that reason, the officer's report sets out why this accords with national, uh, national and local plan policy. So for, for if members are minded to recommend refusal, then you need to have reasons and the reasons need to be supported by national and local plan policy. And that's why we're asking you to, to set that out quite clearly, because this, in terms of any appeal, is we, we, the local planning authority would have to defend on behalf of the council. Do you want to, do you want to come back, Councillor Malik, yeah. with, with your specifics yeah, from I'll, policy I'll, RB7? Yeah, I'll come back to that, yeah. I, I thought you were going to do that now to just to just to outline which specific elements i, I just briefly i just briefly want to respond uh, to andrew on this uh, is not because solicitor has written a letter i'm afraid of solicitor or something that, that was not the case that there are specific policies being mentioned in there and in previously i've been on a planning planning committee long enough maybe the political structure have changed around once uh, we come out with the reason you are absolutely right and equally the officer job is also to help us if the decision can be made so that doesn't mean because we're going against the recommendation and we if we can't find a uh, specifically environment so it has happened in the past okay on different applications where the officers have also helped and this is what one of the job in the offices and you can correct me if i'm telling you the wrong thing but this is why the t taxpayers are here and this is where we also seek guidance from the both side because the other shrews bridge whatever i'm not interested in that bridge what they have said but i'm dealing the application what is front of me and i can give you the reason in a minute because i don't have my laptop i have to go through the stuff uh, what i received but if uh, other councillors who are willing to uh, help me in this <laughs> refusal, they can have a look if they come out with certain other conditions. So we, if, if the decision uh, is taken by the majority of the council on refusal, we will give you the uh, uh, conditions. So, so don't worry about that. You will have enough condition for, to go and defend that uh, application on the refusal basis. Yeah. yeah, just just to clarify, the solicitor's letter doesn't refer to plan, local plan policy. Um, but that aside, as you've said, that that isn't necessarily part of your uh, uh, point. As a lo as as a local authority, you know, and we understand our role here. If if members are minded to recommend refusal, we can assist with the reasons for refusal. But the professional guidance I'm giving you is that at the moment, the reasons that you are suggesting would need to be supported by policy. And so you need to be clearer in terms of, you talked about policy RE7, so the advice I gave you was you'd have to be clear what specifically is the issue with RE7. So that's the advice I would give you, and officers can help on that. Secondly, just the simple point about loss of trees and environmental damage is, is not detailed enough to set out what specifically is the concern of the committee. Again, if that is expanded upon, then officers will provide support. So that's the point, just to clarify. Councillor Fowweather. Um, this is less of a comment and more of a, a, a question which has just occurred to me that I understand the money for this bridge is coming from the Housing Infrastructure Fund. The Oxford, yeah, the Oxfordshire Growth Deal. Yeah. Um, and 
it was said by somebody that if we didn't spend the money on this, it would be lost. I just wanted to make sure in my own mind before I reach a decision whether that is the case and whether anybody here can answer that or whether it's the applicant who could answer that. Okay, perhaps the applicant, perhaps Mr. Comerford, are you able to, are you able to, sorry, I'm sorry. Can you come to the microphone, please, one second. So Jenny Barker, uh, Regeneration Manager for Oxford City Council. So um, the position with the growth deal funding is that there's a requirement from uh, the government that it spent by March 25, and the county council is the accountable body for the spending of the money. So if this bridge doesn't go ahead, the money would go back to the county council and no doubt be put into other schemes across the county. We don't have the option to allocate it to something else. If it's not spent, it would go back to the government. If the county were able to spend it, then it would be spent. And it, it would be a matter for the county. Okay. Uh, Councillor Mundy. Yeah, so uh, obviously I, I seconded uh, Councillor Malik's objection. So just going to the local plan, just in terms of specifics that you're asking for, I was just wanting to uh, open this up as a principle that we could perhaps go on. So um, under, uh, under uh, II, efficient use of land, so this is page 62 of the local plan 2036. The national plan planning policy framework emphasizes that planning policies and decisions should promote the effective use of land in meeting the need for homes and other uses. So this is obviously uh, infrastructure of the uses. While safeguarding and improving the environment and ensuring safe and healthy living conditions. Point 4.9, point <laughs> just below that, using scarce resources efficiently is vital to ensuring Oxford's sustainable growth and development. I would argue that this does not use uh, 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 scarce resources efficiently because it's failing to use an available bridge that is so nearby that is already obviously built and uh, and and require, uh, although the money is there, as, as, as has been discussed about the actual money coming from government, this isn't just about money. This is actually about the actual physical structure of the bridge, the actual uh, impact on the green space that is already there, which is, um, uh, as we said, that is a valuable and scarce resource for the people of Oxford. And uh, we can actually ensure that there is suitable access across the river for the future that does not impact on the use of the green space that is there for people um, at the moment, as we've heard. And of course, about the trees that are also part of that healthy living and enjoyment of that green space uh, for the people of Oxford. Okay, no, um, we can't. We can't take comments from the, from the floor now. Not. No, we're not. We can't. We don't. We're not able to do that. The question and the officers have, have answered that. Cats out. No, 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 no. We no. We we can't. We can't take any any more comments from, from you. It's not. This is not a public meeting. It's a planning meeting that's held in public. Councillor Altaf Khan. No. Uh, Councillor Altaf Khan was it. Um, I think it's quite a strange situation we are. This um, bridge, to me, doesn't look uh, well. It look better than than the other bridge, but the the cost analysis is not part of the planning process. So, and I do see there is a proposal to refuse, but I don't see many of the policy or reasons of refusal which can back up us for the, uh, if it goes to appeal further. Uh, so my still one of the question, which is unclear, I would, if you don't mind chair, ask the cabinet member, um, would she uh, rather explain this, uh, uh, which is not planning and We can't do that. We're in discussions now. The, the, um, we've, we've had questions and, it, and we're now in debate and we're about to, Make a I, th I think, Chair, we, uh, to be honest, I don't want to too much argue about it. As this whole debate started, the first proposal came for refusal. So we were mainly debating or the 
the discussing, there was not much of session about the just question. And I think that that time we should have parked this proposal and deal with the questions and deal then with the we have comments, the questions, comments, so then we comments, into comments, but all things are very mixed up uh, because of that proposal was on table. So uh, I still think there is a little bit more clarification uh, on the, the funding stream. And uh, I know the other person, other person from floor wanted to clarify, but uh, as we are in a committee session, that person can't, but I'm asking for the cabinet member who is here to explain this, so I think uh, that's uh, appropriate. I mean, normally you wouldn't have a cabinet member here, so it wouldn't be appropriate for for them to. Well, she's here, part of the applicant, Councilor. and she spoke 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 with the applicant. So that means we treat that person is whoever spoke for or against. We can ask something from them to clarify. Chair, in terms of the clarification about funding, I, I'm not sure what that how that takes you forward. The, the the point the point of this is in if you the officer's report is a full report which sets out all the material planning considerations. There is a section in that report that talks about the principle of development, i.e., the principle as to why this planning application is coming forward for a bridge and whether that is acceptable in principle. That and with the talk in, in the in the questions was whether that was a political or a planning policy. It's a planning policy. It was an aspiration throughout the local plan in, in a number of policies that talks about providing a crossing across the, uh, the, the site here that improves pedestrian and cycle links to support active travel and sustainable travel. So that's set out throughout the, the local plan in the policies that are all referred to in there. The local plan is a, is a document that has been supported and approved by the council. It's been through a full examination in public. It has got, the, the, the policies are in there, were supported by the council, by all members at full council. So it was adopted. So the policies here are your adopted policies. So that in terms, it sets out the principle of development. The concerns about funding and who funds this bridge, where that funding goes, is, is not essentially a, a matter to be considered here because the principle of this bridge is set out quite clearly in the local plan. Thank you. Um, Councillor Raymond. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, there's lots of things. I mean, it's overlooked that the bridge, um, you know, in a green setting, concrete bridge is OK. Um, that's open to interpretation. Um, I'm probably going to be unpopular with the floor here. Um, um, I'm, 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 I'll start again. I'm really unhappy that we've been put under a lot of pressure by the trees being cut or felled much before and the implication that there's free money going around and if we don't use the money, um, we'll lose the money um, and something other, other things won't happen. But having said all that, um, the principle of the bridge uh, with the local plan, um, I don't think that... I think it complies with all the things that are in the plan, so therefore... I don't think we have a strong enough case to refuse it, but I'm, I'm really unhappy that I have to say that. And it's a contradiction of, um, we talked about political stuff here before. Um, you know, I, I'm really confused with what political stance people are taking um, on some things and others. But however, we're at a planning meeting um, and I, I apologise. I can see the downsides of it all. And it's really frustrating when you see something that you can use and then you want to build something brand new and cause all that damage to the ecosystem around there, but I don't see how we can refuse it on planning terms. Sorry. I think to make it clear, I hope that all members of this committee are making the decision purely on planning grounds and not on party political or other small p political grounds. Just remind you. Yeah. Okay. This is, a, this, is a, this is a planning meeting in public. It's not a public meeting. Alex, could you please stop speaking? Otherwise, we'll have to ask you to leave. Won't we? We'll adjourn no, the that's... meeting.
Has we've been... considered it in the report and we've been... Con... Let's adjourn the meeting for five minutes. Can we reconvene now? And excuse me, everybody, we're going to reconvene and make a decision. Are you happy just to clarify the reasons for? you're proposing that we refuse and to just check that councillor malik is happy with those with reference to policies, with reference to policies. right under the oxford local plan 2036 
Sorry. Okay, so this is uh, II, efficient use of land. So, let's go about four, making wise use of our resources. What do you say, are we so, well, it's, it's, uh, this is under section four, making wise use of our resources and securing good quality local environment. Is, is local, plan? local plan 2036. Yeah. Okay. 62. Right, 62, that's not a policy, that's a preamble to the policy. So you're referring to what, sorry? Take, take me through it. Yeah, so II, efficient use of land. Yes, right. Yeah. The national, national planning policy framework emphasizes that planning policies and decisions should promote the effective use of land in meeting the need for homes and other uses, yeah. while safeguarding and improving the environment and ensuring safe and healthy living conditions. Yeah. Okay, it, I, the rest of that paragraph I don't think is so relevant to us here. The following paragraph, 4.9, using scarce resources eff uh, efficiently it is, is vital in ensuring Oxford's sustainable growth and development. Yeah. Uh, uh, and it goes, to, goes on to say about how Oxford is a small, constrained city with a growing population. Yeah. Now, I'm just calling into question whether this is a, uh, an efficient use of resources and, and, and a sustainable form of growth and development. So, so your reason for refusal is this is not an efficient use of resources? Yeah. As, and, or... Uh, uh, to deliver sustainable growth and development. Yeah. Why? Why? Because there is already a bridge in place so close by that does not require that use of resources that would is obviously needed for an entire uh, bridge in replacement. Right. And there's also obviously, as I've said earlier, the effective use of land, whereby we do have that use of land for the new bridge itself. Sorry, say that. That doesn't. Well, make sense. as I said in the previous paragraph, there, four point eight. And, and uh, uh, promoting the effective use of land in meeting the need for homes and other uses, yeah. while safeguarding and improving the environment and ensuring self and uh, safe and healthy living conditions. Right. So we are talking about the uh, preservation of that land, that green space, the trees that have been discussed as well, and the public enjoyment of that space, right, which right. is being compromised. Just, just to bear with me, right? Yeah. The preservation yeah. of that land. Yeah. Yeah. And the compromising of the use of that green space for public use. Right, okay, just bear with me. Yeah. Okay. So in terms of that, the first point, your point about say uh, uh, that, that you don't consider this to be efficient use of resources because uh, there is already a bridge adjacent which you consider could be used. Okay, well, the office, just to, to clarify, you would have to set out, the officer's report has already given you, and it's already been said at this committee, why the, the, uh, the adjacent bridge couldn't be used. So you would have to support that on appeal as to why you think that bridge can be used to deliver all of the, the, the growth and to deliver, uh, to, to be usable at all times, you know, in terms of the policy. So... That's, that as is, to whether that's, the new bridge could be could that, be used at all times, because I don't think that's the case. But that's that that in itself would be what you would have to justify. That in itself would be a valid planning reason for refusal. The second point about the effective use of the land and the preservation of that land, because you think it's going to compromise the land for public use, my advice to you would be that is not a valid reason for refusal, because it's quite clear that the use of the Grand Point Nature Reserve wouldn't be prohibited as a result of this development for public use. The manner in which certain people are using it or the manner in which the enjoyment they, they take from it um, you know, may alter in terms of some people may take that view, others may not take that view. My view is that isn't a valid planning reason for refusal that you could support or justify because it is still going to be used for public use. This development is not going to stop that in any way, shape or form. Public will still access Grand Point and we'll still be able to walk through Grand Pond Nature Reserve. That's just a matter of fact. So I don't consider that to be a valid reason for refusal under that policy. So those would be my, my the, the planning just uh, response I would give to that. But again, I would advise you at, at appeal, you would have to quite significantly set out why you think 
that the gas works bridge is an appropriate use. And I think that would be a very difficult thing to do based on what's set out in the report. Okay. Councillor Malik, are you happy to, I, I am with, happy with the reasons that Councillor Mundy has proposed? Yeah, I am happy what given and I also and understand the from yeah, what, what from Andrew office. just said. And when we come to the appeal, if that's refused here, then we will make the case. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And so, we, just, could, could I just clarify? So you, you've heard the advice that um, uh, Mr Murdoch has given you. Um, are, are you going just for the, the one about the, the gas bridge um gaswitz bridge or sure you, yeah i mean I not the yeah. the other second reason you gave just to, we just need to know definitely and obviously other members need to know in order to decide how to vote sure i mean it sounds like that it's uh, you know he's called into question uh, that the use of the land is is no longer compromised i mean I, what i will say about the new bridge is it does not ensure access to the south of the river in times of flooding um, I can see, obviously, the bridge is, uh, as we can see, is obviously above the flood line, but the actual connecting paths to it are not. So they would continue to be impacted. So I know that's not part of the actual application, but Just, it does impact the, the access to the bridge, and therefore it doesn't make it any more suitable for accessing the south of the river than the current bridge that's there. Just to clarify, the, the, the path works on the, on the northern side are outside the flood zone and cuts into an element on the southern side that is also outside the flood zone. Parts of the towpath leading to Oxbens, uh, to Osney Mead would obviously not be outside the flood zone. But again, there are a, a number of elements here that are outside the flood zone, so it's just not strictly correct. But We've got a proposal to um, refuse this application, um, proposed by Councillor Manick and seconded by Councillor Mundy. Can I see all those... Who are who want to support who who are want to refuse this application? Show your hands now. And all those against refusal, please show your hands. Five. And any abstentions? One abstention. No. Okay. In which case the refusal falls. We will now um, take a vote on 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 the um, the officer's recommendation which is to approve this application. Can I see all those? Is it seconded? And I'm proposing it. I will propose it. And do I have a seconder? Councillor Corres. Can I have all, see all those in favour of approving this application? Please show your hands. Five. And all those against? Two. And any abstentions? In which case that application is passed. Thank you, everybody, for your patience. This evening, and we will move on to our next agenda item.
to it agenda item five, which is the um, which is Oz unit one at Ozone Leisure Park. Can I hand that over to Mike Kemp. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Chair. Um, just before I begin the presentation, I uh, do have a couple of updates. Um, so since the publication of the report, the Environment Agency have formally lifted their objection to the development. Um, and this is subject to three recommended conditions, uh, namely that the development is carried out in accordance with the revised flood risk assessment. There's no raising of the ground levels uh, within the 1% annual exceedance probability flood extent. And finally, a requirement that no development takes place within the 10 metre buffer zone of the Littlemore Brook. Um, so officers agree with the three conditions suggested by the EA and advise that the conditions should be attached to any permission should members be minded to, um, to resolve to approve the application. There's also a correction in the report in terms of the uh, SIL payment figure. Um, so this reflects the fact that the building has not been in continuous occupation for at least six of the last 36 months. So the report uh, notes that the SIL liability was £215,867.07 uh, as per the originally submitted SIL form. As per the revised form, the SIL liability would be £345,247.11. Uh, um, so going through the presentation slides, uh, so this is the site location plan outlined in red. Um, so it's a uh, unit that was formerly occupied uh, by a bingo hall. Um, it attaches to the Ozone Leisure Complex located at the Kassam Stadium site. Um, so have the Hampton by Hilton Hotel to the south of the site. Beyond this, the Grade 2 star list of Priory. Oxford Signs Park to the southwest of the site. And uh, existing residential developments, uh, namely Mintry Farm Cottages, um, located to the northwest of the site. Um, this is an aerial plan of the site, um, so it's worth mentioning that um, under a previous planning application, um, that planning permission was granted to use the building for a wide variety of uses falling within Class E of the use classes order. So this is all uses excluding retail. And this would include the proposed life sciences use, which is sought under this planning application. So it shows some elevations of the, the building um, as is its existing condition. Um, so this is the front entrance of the building. This is the elevation which faces uh, the Littlemore Brook, north elevation in the building. Uh, this elevation here is the west elevation. Uh, Mintree Lane is to the, to the uh, left-hand side of this image here. And this is the existing service road which runs to the, the rear uh, service yard at the back of the um, existing bingo hall. And this is a view of the site uh, taken from Minshury Lane adjacent to the site. And this is a view of the rear service yard um, associated with the, the former bingo hall. Uh, so the, um, oh, sorry, this is the, the north car park of the building um, looking towards the front entrance of the bingo hall. So this is the proposed site plan. So the proposals are to demolish the existing building and construct a new five-storey building housing 10,929 square metres of lab and office space. Um, the building will be detached from the adjacent buildings in the ozone leisure complex. The um, service road to the north will be removed and replaced by a new pedestrian and cycle access route between Minshew Lane and the Kassam Stadium opening up a new route through the site, improving connectivity and permeability of movement. The access road and landscaping has recently been revised uh, to account for the request by the Environment Agency to maintain a 10 metre buffer to the Littlemore Brook. Service access will be provided to the eastern side of the building where this adjoins the retained ozone buildings. In terms of the principle of development, significant weight must be given to the fact that the existing building could be reused for the proposed use under the previously granted planning permission, and therefore the community use of the site as a bingo hall would not be afforded significant protection. And officers consider that this is a significant fallback position, which, um, which represents material justification to depart from policy V7 of the local plan. 
In terms of the proposed use, uh, the site's not allocated currently for an employment use in the local plan, but it does adjoin the Oxford Science Park, which is allocated, and the site lies within the Cowley Branch Line area of change, and policy A. OC7 promotes the development of high density employment uses within the Cowley Branch Line area of change. The ozone leisure complex has been allocated in the council's emerging local plan and the policy, that particular site policy, allows for commercial uses, albeit that the, the policy is afforded very limited weight at the present time. So there's significant uh, demand for additional life science use within Oxford. The proposals would assist in meeting this demand providing an expected 438 jobs and significant benefits, um, economic benefits in terms of the proposed development. The applicants have agreed to producing a community employment and procurement plan that would secure local employment opportunities during the operational and construction phases of the development that would be secured by Section 106 agreements. This is the site landscaping plan, so it's um, showing the permeable paving that would uh, replace the existing service roads, new areas of public ground, new planting, and um, significant biodiversity net gain would be secured, um, well exceeding the council's 5% policy, uh, 15, it's 15.72% uh, in terms of habitat units, 9.6% in terms of river units. So these are the proposals uh, for parking. So there's no increase proposed in parking across the site. Um, a car park management plan will be needed in order to ensure that um, staff uh, do not park within the uh, existing wider parking associated with Kisham Stadium, which is, is currently um, a substantial parking surrounding that. And were staff to park within that parking, it would uh, obviously undermine the objectives of uh, achieving a, a modal shift away from private car use and um, achieving the the low um, the, the 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 low modal share in uh, private car use, uh, which the applicants are targeting, which is forty six percent of staff travelling to sites by private car. Um, there are proposals um, which will be secured within the section one hundred six to reduce parking to uh, thirty. 5% of the, the modal share should the Cowley branch line come operational. And um, in order to uh, promote sustainable travel to the site, financial contributions are sought towards uh, a split, which is split between uh, securing money towards the Eastern Arc bus service and the, the Cowley branch line. Going through the floor plans, uh, this is the, the ground floor plan for the building. Uh, so there's a cafe space in the top left-hand corner, uh, which would face the new public realm and Minshury Lane. The remainder of the building would be a split of uh, flexible lab and office space. And this is a typical upper floor plan of the building. These are elevations of the building. So top slide shows the frontage of the building, which would uh, face a little more brook. And the, um, the bottom slide is the east elevation, which would face the proposed service yard. And these are the south and west elevations. Uh, so the, the south elevation um, of the building faces the, the service yard and Hilton Hotel. The west elevation faces Minchery Lane. Um, height of the buildings, 24.2 metres to the top of the plant enclosure. 25.2 metres, 25.4 metres to the top of the proposed flues. Um, so whilst the, the scale of the building's relatively substantial, it's also commensurate with the scale of um, some of the surrounding buildings at the, the Oxford Science Park, in particular Plot 16, of which um, one of the buildings has recently been constructed and there's approval for, for another building on that site. Um, proposed materials are a mix of limestone with uh, bronze coloured aluminium cladding, which are considered to be appropriate and of a high standard. In sustainability terms, the, um, the, the building would exceed the 40% carbon reduction requirements outlined in the local plan. Uh, these are some visuals of the proposed building. So this is the corner facing Minchery Lane. And this is a view down Minchery Lane, um, showing the, the west elevation, the proposed building. 
And this is the, the front entrance to the proposed building. Finally, some views uh, showing the, the building and sat within the context of uh, firstly, the overflow car park. Secondly, uh, from the other side of the, the railway line, uh, building to the right is the scale of the of the uh, plot 16 building, which has planning approval. And this is a view of the building uh, taken from the rear of the, the Priory. Um, so as outlined in the report, it's considered that there would be a, a level of a uh, moderate level of less than substantial harm to the setting of the Priory uh, by virtue of um, introduction of a building of a substantial scale. Uh, which would um, further detract alongside the existing buildings from the setting of the Priory. Um, <clears throat> it's also identified that there would be a, a low level of um, less than substantial harm to the setting of the central conservation area um, by reason of the um, slight encroachment of the building um, and visual impact in views from St Mary's Tower um, across the city to the, the suburbs and, and little more. Um, however, in both instances, it's considered that the, the very significant public benefits of development, which are outlined in the report, um, would outweigh uh, the level of um, the low level of less than substantial harm and moderate level of less than substantial harm to the central conservation area and uh, priory, respectively. <clears throat> Finally, it's a view of the. Um, site from uh, Grenoble Road, where we see the building sat within the context of the um, existing buildings in the Ozone Leisure Park. So for the reasons outlined in the report, um, officers recommend approval of the application subject to the relevant conditions and subject to the matters to be secured by legal agreement. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, we don't have anybody speaking against, but we've got Rachel Streeter and Raoul Vivas um, do you want do you want to make a speech or do you just want to be available to answer questions? Um, yeah. It's very short. Yeah, that's fantastic. We like short speeches, particularly at this time of evening. Good evening. I'm Raoul Vivas from JLL. I'm speaking on behalf of the applicant for Roca Limited. The proposed development of the Ozone Leisure Park will deliver approximately 11,000 state-of-the-art floor space for life sciences, providing purpose-built laboratories and offices. The development will form an extension to the life sciences ecosystem in Oxford, contributing to the retention and attraction of life sciences companies and scientific talent. The development responds to an enormous need. There is minimal vacancy levels of lab space in Oxford, particularly in the cluster, only 1%. And JLL have tracked 85,000 square metres of active lab demand in Oxford area alone. There's an opportunity to grow the life sciences cl cluster in this part of Oxford in combination with neighbouring Oxford Science Park and wide ranging suite of benefits will be delivered by the scheme to the local economy if approved. The proposal will generate approximately 438 jobs and many hundreds more in the short term during the construction phase. And including business rates, the contribution it will make to the local economy is therefore significant, far in excess of the previous use of the site. Of the application site is also highly sustainable being previously developed land within the settlement boundary of Oxford and immediately adjacent to the Science Park. It represents a more suitable and sustainable location which is able to accommodate a life sciences need within the short term and alleviates pressure for development of the green belt. The existing leisure building is purpose built and therefore redevelopment is necessary to secure a viable future of this previously developed urban site. The principle of the proposed use is also acceptable, having been established by a recent change of use application. Class E includes the proposed life science use. Not only when the proposed development deliver cutting edge purpose built lab space, a significant number of new jobs will further cement Oxford's position as a leading global centre of research and life sciences. It will also provide significant suite of benefits secured by this permission. These include £450,000 worth of payments towards public transport improvements, bus infrastructure and the delivery of the Cowley branch line. Um, SIL contribution of approximately £350,000, 
high environmental performance for the building, including energy saving, water efficiency, carbon reduction of over 40%, and sustainability measures to a BRIAM excellent standard. Ecological enhancements include blue and green roofs, resulting in biodiversity net gain of 9.6%, which is significantly above the city plan policy of 5%. Environmental enhancements to Littlemore and Northfield Brook, activation of Mintry Lane and the enhancement of this street scene to prioritise pedestrians and cycle access, including promotion of active travel through 88 cycle spaces. A sustainable urban drainage system, an agreement to enter into community employment and procurement plan, and new communal open spaces, and significantly enhanced public realm. There are no ob obligations to this application from statutory consultees, and the proposed development will deliver significant benefits for the local economy, the community, infrastructure, and the environment. We respectfully ask members to go with the recommendation of your officers and approve the planning application. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, now, questions for officers and for the um, agent. Councillor Upton. Thank you. Because one, well, I've read the ODRP report, which was not entirely glowing. Um, and I'm just wondering, I, th I think it was from April last year. So um, I, I don't know if you've been the old case officer on that all along, but have, have, there, have there been significant sort of improvements made to it since the ODRP, as a result of those ODRP comments? Um, yes, I mean, there's certainly been work has been done to the, the facade of the building to improve it and its relationship, particularly with the, the Priory, which was an issue that had come up at ODRP. Um, scale of the building is somewhat limited by the um, the demands of its use as lab and, and uh, office space and functional requirements. Um, so there's always going to be an impact on the Priory. I think the elevation of treatment has been significantly improved um, since the scheme that was presented to ODRP. Um, so that is certainly a benefit, as has the, the landscaping scheme has improved quite significantly as well, which again was something that was questioned by the panel. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry, one more. Yes, it, yeah, they, it was the landscape thing they worried about and they had a lot of uh, recommendations about the bike parking as well, I think, and having bonded gravel rather than paving and things like that. Um, and one thing that did stick out to me, given that our next version of the local plan was going to have really, is going to be really asking for net zero buildings. And they had some, the ODRP mentioned, you, they might be able to improve the sort of the orientation of the building, et cetera, to make it more uh, environmentally friendly. Were, were those taken into consideration as well, some of those things? <clears throat> Yeah, there's certainly work done on the landscaping. I think one of the criticisms at, uh, from the ODRP was that um, it was too formal. Um, it ran too much like a business park plaza, and that's been improved, I think. Certainly in the, the revisions that have been made to the plan to make it appear more natural and blend in with Mintry Lane, which has a kind of semi-rural feel to it. Um, I mean, in terms of sustainability, the, the building does exceed the, the local plan or meets the local plan policy in terms of um, energy efficiency. So I think it meets with policy in that respect. Yeah. Councillor Chapman. Thank you very much. Uh, three areas, really. I'm trying to understand the weight you gave to the significant loss of leisure facilities in the area, mm. um, which has been remarked on by the Civic Society and others. Um, the second issue is about the height of the building and maybe I missed it but I, I was trying to work out what the relation between this new building and the, the so-called residential cottages nearby is how close are they to it how far though, is there a sense of that they would be overwhelmed by a building of this scale um, and there's also comments about Littlemore Priory but I can't understand how Littlemore Priory is going to do with this really because it's not part of the site. Is it? Is it? Is it more priory close to the? Very close to the site. Is it? Impact. Okay, you you return to that matter. And finally, um, one of the refrains that comes across in all the comments is about a lack of public consultation. Now, I assume when you come forward with a proposal to approve, you are giving us assurance that the public consultation process was comprehensive. 
just for the record. So it's a couple of issues around swamping, in inverted commas, public consultation and the use of the site as a leisure facility. Sorry. Uh, yes, just in terms of consultation, I mean, council entirely fulfilled their statutory duty in terms of consultation. So several sign notices were posted around the site, so all residents were informed. I think that comment refers more to the pre-application consultation that may have been carried out by the applicant as opposed to the council's consultation they carried out during the planning process. Um, just on the loss of the, the leisure facility, I think it's the weight that's given to um, the, the planning permission that was granted last year for the change of use of the building to uh, a Class E um, use. So Class E covers a wide variety of uses, including um, the, the type of use that's being sought under this application. So it's the, the sense that the, the community use is not um, does not benefit from protection in the sense that it could be changed to another use under that existing planning permission tomorrow um, where the applicant wanting to do that and retain the existing building. So that's a substantial fallback position that we need to consider when looking at the, the principle of developments. Um, just in terms of the height of the building relationship to the cottages, I've um, covered it in some detail in the amenity section of the report, um, but the distance, I believe, 77 metres to the cottages, um, which is pretty substantial. There's a daylight sunlight assessment prepared, which um, suggests that there's, there's a, it's negligible the impact in terms of uh, of overshadowing. Um, 77 metres is a large distance where even when considering the scale of the building and uh, potential overbearingness, so he's satisfied that there is enough distance there that the building wouldn't appear overbearing. And likewise, is a large distance we're considering overlooking as well, even accounting for the scale of the building. Um, the Priory is near the site. Um, so the, as acknowledged in the heritage section of the report, there is an impact on uh, the setting of the Priory, which is great to star listed. Um, assessment is that, that it's uh, less than substantial harm, uh, moderate level, um, but that the benefits outweigh um, the, the harm to that particular heritage asset. Thank you. Councillor Fowweather. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I note in the officer's report, there's quite a long discussion about um, the fact that the Kassam Stadium next door is zoned for um, housing, possibly in the future. Um, it could, and I did read the bit, the amenity part of the, um, the report about um, overlooking and what have you, but one point did occur to me about that, um, which perhaps you could clarify, and that is, should the Kassam Stadium site become available for housing, would it would this building reduce the number of houses that could be built because they'd have to be further away? Yeah, yeah. so it looks that closely. I think it is addressed in the, the amenity section of the report. So um, <clears throat> that particular part of the site lies mainly within flood zone two and three, um, so it would not be a target area that we'd naturally want to consider for the siting and the housing. Um, so there is capacity across the remainder of the part of the site, um, that overflow car park site, to deliver the number of units um, that we'd want to deliver within uh, the, both the existing local plan and, and the emerging local plan um, in terms of the, the policy allocation. So I guess in summary, it's that part of the development immediately to the north of the, of the existing building is not an area that we want to put the housing on due to the flood risk. Okay. Do you want to... Yeah, I mean, just to add to that, that part of the, the overflow car park where housing would be delivered, there are other constraints around there on the other side, opposite the other side of the car park, where you've got a line of cottages where there may also already be, you know, elements that we would have to consider with regards to the future development of that part of the site. So possibly wouldn't result in a significant impact because there's already constraints there anyway. Councillor Raymond. Thank you. Uh, just to be clear then, so 
when when Kassam Stadium does come forward, if it comes forward for um, housing, there'll be restrictions on um, parking for residents and stuff. Um, but you're relying on the car park there for the employees or visitors to come to here. Is that is that is that fair assumption? There needs to be a mechanism in the Section 106 agreement that allows for the parking as shown on the current plans to potentially be moved elsewhere within the site to allow for comprehensive development of the Kassam Stadium site, however that comes forward, depending on the future of that site. Um, so that's why there's the flexibility that would be written into the legal agreement for those spaces to be sited somewhere else within the very large blue line area that the, the applicant owns um, to allow for, as I say, the site to be developed comprehensively. Councillor Altaf Khan. <clears throat> for a change, uh, Chair, can I move the official recommendation to the vote? We're still in questions, actually, and okay. I don't know if um, we haven't had people haven't had chance to. In the uh, last application, we've. We didn't know when the question and comments were, well, but I thought the questions are over. And my... well, I, think, I think we did, but anyway, um, can we... Uh, so let, let's wait for people to, so we're sure that everyone's all, had all their questions satisfactorily answered, and then we'll move into debate, but I'll keep that in mind. Okay, so no more questions. Any, okay. Um, can you sit back? Oh, yes, yes. So no, if we're moving into debate, can you sit back again? Thank you. Thanks. Just where we've got to try. Yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> okay, comments, please. Councillor Raymond. So, um, you know, with the V7, I'm a bit concerned that because it's so near the science park and that science park is still not fully developed, so therefore the rush to um, all these labs is... Um, yeah, at the moment, it's, there's a shortage, but there's lots in the pipeline. So um, bearing in mind the Kassam Stadium is more than likely to be for residential use. There's possibility of something across the other side of this um, thing and the, and the other Class E facilities that we're going to lose, <clears throat> excuse me, and then what happens to the leisure centre. So um, this incremental um, sort of just pushing back the boundaries, I'm a bit concerned about. Um, I think there's lots of sites that are coming forward for um, R and D um, and lab space. So um, this is not going to be. It's not going to happen overnight. And there's many more. So although you know there may be an 85% shortage today, um, by the time all the other construction is done, it may not be the case. Um, so I'm just that's just my concerns with this. Okay. So presumably, if that demand is satisfied, then developers will perhaps move on to to other things we can't know and so we're left with you know, have to make a decision on the application that we've got in front of us okay um councillor upton and then councillor Marley. thank you chair I, yeah i think i was going to propose that we approve this um yeah i think it, it really underlines the fact that oxford is one of the very few parts of the country that's making a net positive contribution to the uh to the national economy Life sciences here are absolutely booming. We just heard there's only 1% empty space. 1% of current sites are empty. Um, you know, we, we, are, we are the Silicon Valley of the UK, really, and uh, which is in many ways great. Um, you know, it, these things tend to cluster together. So, um, I mean, I, I quite hear your comments, Councillor Raymond. It, it, it would be nice to keep it as a leisure facility, ideally, but um, given that that boat that ship has sailed it's already got permission to to have this kind of use then i think we just have to to welcome it it looks a pretty fabulous building i think it will um you know it, it it's going to be lying alongside the science park or close to the science park and just forming this real you know booming knowledge cluster so with all of the planning conditions that are outlined by officers and the section 106 agreement as well yes if you want to come in yeah, thank you. Well, unfortunately, nobody's playing bingo anymore. That's why, sure. <laughs> so, so I think this uh, is, is a good design, is the enhancement, enhancement to the area. I was listening to the question earlier because uh, I know the area well and how far the cottages are and the height is not an issue. 
So I agree what is being said. So let's move to the vote and just pass this application, I think. Are there any more comments? We've got the proposal on the table. Um, and I think we've got, with Councillor Upton, we've got two seconders. Ah, oh, Councillor Mundy. Yeah, just very quickly. I mean, yeah, likewise to the others, I, I, I'd be in favour and, and obviously, you know, I really support the energy efficiency of the building and, and obviously the, the construction of the building. Um, and obviously that we're ensuring that the... Uh, uh, the 106 agreement, as we've previously mentioned, was obviously ensuring that there wasn't going to be a parking impact on the leisure facilities or on the surrounding area um, as a result of the, the uh, staff attendance at the building. Yeah. Thank you. Now, we've got a proposal on the table from Councillor Upton. Can I just clarify who is seconding it? Councillor Malik. What happened to my proposal? I don't want to be argumental here, but I do feel the way things are done. I made my proposal. You said I will keep in mind... And is that purposely to have your colleague to proposed and second? Okay, well, fine. If you want to, I mean, I, I, I think we've got. Makes, a I, I, I have to speak here now in, in debate. That makes me very uncomfortable. I made this proposal already. If you look at the previous application discussion and this discussion, so that may, gives me something different. So, whatever you wanted to, you go ahead with it. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm sorry if you misinterpreted what I was going to do. I think if, if, if we're happy, then you can propose it and, and, and Council Upton's happy to second it. Okay, so we have a proposal on the table um, to approve the officer's recommendation. All those in favour of the application? So nobody, <coughs> nobody against. Thank you. For that, so I go and get
patients um, on a long agenda tonight. Um, for our final um, planning application, which is um, the demolition of building at Medina Mosque and the erection of a three-storey building. And to Rob. Thank you, Chair. The application site is the annex at the Medina Mosque on Stanley Road. So on the screen, this is a site location plan and block plan. Stanley Road, I've got a laser pointer here somewhere. Okay. So I've got a laser pointer here on the screen. So sorry. Okay. Right. Stanley Road runs to the northwest of the application site. Um, Morton Road is accessed from this alley that runs along the southeast of the um, uh, the application site. Sorry, the southwest of the application site. Um, and this building just over here on my the, on the screen. This is number sixty one Morton Road. Student accommodation lies to the southwest of the application site. And then Ifley Road is beyond. Description of the application site in more detail is set out in paragraph 5.1 of the officer report on page 166 of your agendas. I'm going to take you through some photos of the existing application site. All the plans and photographs I'm about to show you were circulated prior to the meeting this evening, so I'll move through these quite quickly. I can always come back if the uh, members have any questions. So I don't know why this has turned the wrong way up. Apologise for that. Um, I've got some other pictures, but this is a better picture. So this is a, an image of the um, alley that runs between Stanley and Morton Road. So the pale brick building is the existing main mosque building, which fronts onto Stanley Road, and the red brick is the existing annex, which is proposed to be demolished. And this is a view looking along the alley the other way, south eastwards, towards Morton Road, with the annex in the background and the main mosque building in the foreground. And this is an existing view of the rear courtyard. And this is actually an older photograph. Small building in the corner, again, I use my laser pointer, um, is, has actually been extended. Um, this, um, uh, so this photograph isn't actually contemporary. Um, and these uh, old yew trees, I believe, have actually been removed um, following a grant of planning permission. Um, the building in the background, just beyond the trees where I'm holding my at the laser pointer at the moment. This is number 61 Morton Road, which I referred to just now. The annex is the building where I'm just hovering my cursor at the moment. It's on the right-hand side in this photograph. This is the external staircase, which serves as a fire escape for the mosque. And then this is another image of that same courtyard. So you've got the morgue building here, which has now been extended. Again, these trees have been removed. This is the main mosque building. And then you can just see residential properties in Stanley Road beyond where I'm just hovering my laser pointer there. So I'll just take you through the plans. Um, these are the existing floor plans of the annex building, which was last used for residential accommodation in conjunction with the mosque. The existing elevations of the, main, of the annex. And this is a rear elevation of the existing annex. Now I've got a proposed site plan and ground floor plan. Planning permission is sought to demolish the existing annex and replace it with a three-storey building adjoining the rear of the existing mosque. The proposed building would be constructed from red brick to match the existing and incorporates an asymmetrical pitched roof with roof lights so that the upper floor is partially set within the roof space. The re proposed replacement annex would provide a new community hall at ground floor level and two two-bedroom flats at the first and second floor levels accessed externally from a replacement metal staircase. I'm just hovering my pointer there, just over where that staircase is. The replacement staircase would still provide a fire escape for the main mosque building at the rear. So these are the proposed first and second floor plans. So again, so you would come up this staircase and then you'd be able to access each of the flats at the first floor. Each has their own staircase up to a second floor. And then where I'm just hovering my cursor at the moment, that's the uh, proposed fire escape, replace, replacement fire escape for the mosque. So this is the proposed alley elevation. So the elevation facing towards the student accommodation, the proposed courtyard elevation. So you can see that staircase I was referring to just now and the proposed rear elevation. 
This is this asymmetrical roof that I referred to as well. I've been forwarded some late objections that may also have been sent on to some members of the committee. Officers consider that the matters raised in those objections relate to immunity, parking and highway safety considerations that are already discussed in the officer report. The officer recommendation is to grant planning permission subject to conditions as set out in section 12 of the officer report on page 189 of your agendas. Thank you. Thank you. Now we've got two people who wish to speak. No, sorry, um, Mr. Scholar, who wishes to speak against, and Aman Alvi for the application. Mr. Scholar, are you happy to come forward now? And you will have five minutes to make your case. Uh, well, um, my name is Michael Scholar. <clears throat> and I'm the chairman of the Ifley Road Area Residents Association. I want to say at the very beginning that we wish to be good neighbours to the mosque. They have extended the hand of friendship to us, and we wish to reciprocate. Uh, and I'm sorry to be here tonight objecting to this planning application. But our objection is essentially that the site is already overdeveloped, and that the present application would develop it further. The mosque was created uh, from a family house in Stanley Road uh, in a conservation area, and then extended by building in the back garden a hall large enough, according to a, a previous imam at the mosque, to accommodate up to 800 people. Uh, the building was then configured so as to accommodate six HMO units, residential units, and a school for up to 150 children. Same source. A morgue, as we've just seen in the picture, was added in what remained, what little remained of the back garden. These developments have imposed severe strains on the mosque's in immediate environment, it, the mosque has space for parking of just three cars. Stanley Road, Ifley Road and Maudlin Road are often lined with cars parked on double yellow lines in the cycle lanes and across gateways and drives. At peak times, mosque attendees spill out onto the pavement and into the road. Neighbours suffer from loss of privacy from noise and light pollution. Because Stanley Road is not wide and parking is allowed on both sides of the street, there's sometimes much reversing and manoeuvring, even backwards into Ifley Road. I've circulated photos to committee members and you'll have seen what uh, we experience. The claim by the traffic impact analysis attached to the application that there'll be very limited use of cars by the additional mosque attendees and the uh, residents of the two new flats is completely implausible in our view. We believe that the present traffic situation is not just difficult, just inconvenient, but that it's dangerous. And we've drawn this to the attention of the county's, county's highway committee. There are two schools in Stanley Road, the nursery school at number 13 and the school run by the mosque itself. Children, children sometimes run out of these school, from these schools and neighbours have witnessed some very dangerous moments. It's now proposed to add further to these pressures to enlarge the annex to create a new communal hall that will accommodate new attendees and new activities plus the two new two-bedroom flats. We note that the council has never previously certified the annexes accommodation spaces as lawful additions to the six HMO residential units in Two Stanley Road. I've not time to enumerate the many points at which we contest the officer's report it's simply incorrect that there'll be no loss of, of light or privacy for numbers four and six Stanley Road and the Maudlin Road flats with the increased height of the annex, 
the new balcony, extended balcony, and the additional windows. Paragraph 1034 says that officers are satisfied, quotes, in the current context of the application site, that this application would not give rise to a materially harmful impact in privacy terms and complies with policies H14 and RE7 of the Oxford Local Plan. We are not satisfied, and we hope that committee members will not be satisfied. The annex is going to be three stories. Uh, at the moment, it isn't three stories all the way along. It's three stories right by the, mo the old the mosque building. Um, it's wider um, th than at present. Um, it uh, has a balcony going all the way along uh, uh, the uh, proposed uh, um, replacement building. There are nine windows uh, proposed. Can you, can you wind up soon? Because I'll I will. To find five minutes. Okay. Sorry, yes, I will. Uh, um, nine windows instead of four, which um, overlook numbers four and number six, Stanley Road. Uh, we also don't believe that there's no adverse on high, highway safety. I cannot understand that assertion, no adverse effect. There must be some adverse effect from the proposals. Uh, we, are, we hope that you will reject the application, but if you don't and you're minded to agree to it, we ask three things. Will you please uh, uh, ask that the bulk of the new building be scaled back to in, in order to limit the effects on light and privacy? and that you don't grant permission for the new flat, and finally, that you don't sanction the appropriation by the mosque of part of a rear communal alleyway, which is shown on the plans before you today. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm sorry to that's have right, that's uh, overstepped that's my right. time. Um, If you could go and sit sit back and got um Aman Alvi speaking and stand. Good evening. I was just here for questions. That's okay, that's fine. That's absolutely fine. Yeah. Okay. In which case, um questions for the officers and applicant. Okay. Councillor Malik. Yeah, it's just a question to the officer on uh uh a couple of things actually. Uh on, on the parking issue, the objector raised, and also I want to know the, I saw the distance uh, in your report, 10.34 uh, uh, distance to uh, four and six, 14 meter, is that correct? So I think the, uh, sorry, the, I think the uh, dimension here, it says that the upper floor windows at first and second floor will be situated approximately 12 metres from the boundary of the number four, uh, four Stanley Road. The 14 metres, I think, is the existing. Um, yeah, that's the, I think that's the existing building. So it's, it's, a, it's a, a reduction in that distance from 14 metres to 12 metres as a result of the increased width of the building. 10 metres, 10 metres. Just bear with us. We'll just just check the. This. So just to confirm, on this ground floor plan, that's ten meters to the boundary, but then the upper floors are the building is narrower, so it's approximately twelve meters, and the existing building is approximately fourteen meters from that boundary with number four. So on this on this plan here so on this plan here on the you've got this distance is what we're inter is what we're dealing with here between the existing the proposed building and the boundary with number four which is potentially the most relevant distance in relation to overlooking can can you please restrict comments to um to to, to um committee members that Councillor Altaf Khan. Um, the 
objective mention about the light pollution. As this is a extension on the backyard, so the light pollution surely if there is, is going to be towards the flats. So I'm not exactly sure how far are those and how this impact of the light pollution is on number four and number six. So then if it's further on the back, surely that light pollution is back. So can you please uh, explain a little bit? A bit confusing. Yeah? Yes, so um, the proposed building would have obviously windows on the back proposed elevations. So this window, I'm just hovering over here. This is a first floor window facing towards number 61 Malton Road. And then obviously you've got the proposed windows in the courtyard and the obscure glazed windows in the alley. Um, these would obviously be lit, but the existing building um, already includes um, is whilst it's not currently in use and can be capable of use, it could be repaired, brought up to standard and give rise to some similar light impacts in terms of what is typical in a, um, uh, on, on a site in this area where you've got windows and, and residential properties um, giving rise to some, you know, some light from windows. I don't think that there is a specific concern around lighting up the courtyard. If members were concerned about that, they could add an additional condition um, that would specifically preclude the use of lighting in that in that courtyard space. There's, that's not a, that's not included in the application. Thank you, Councillor Raymond. Then Councillor. Thank you, Chair. A um, couple of questions. Um, it's ten metres from the boundary, um, but on that side to number four, it, you, you know, the new building does it impact any windows, or and if it does, it's the distance. I mean, it doesn't. It doesn't look like it does to me. But I'm just just want to check. That's one question. Um, the six HMOs re unregistered or not? Um, do they have the potential for twelve? And then, if they're replaced by two two bedroom flats, does that mean the actual the occupancy would probably go down? So, uh, last, sorry, sorry. So that you'd have to come back to me, chair. Um, I understand from an email that I received, and I didn't make any comments on it, that the, the hall that's there is it's for the whole of the public, not just for the Muslim members of the mosque. And it's a, like a warm weather room um, where they can go and heat and sit and rest. Is, uh, could you confirm that if that's part of the application or not? Thank you. I'll, um, uh, I'll take the HMO question first, if that's OK. So they, um, the main building, um, the main mosque building has at the upper floors some existing um, flats, which I think are in use as HMOs. Um, they were certified to be lawful around five or six years ago. Um, I, I can't remember exactly how many units or how many bedrooms there are there. Um, but in terms of these proposals, we've got an additional two flats um, I don't think that necessarily means that there is an over-occupation of the premises. They're two very different parts of the application site. Um, I hope that resolves that bit of the query. Um, coming back to these dimensions, just to be absolutely clear, the first floor and second floor windows would be a distance of would be a distance of approximately twelve meters from the boundary with number four. Okay, and that compares currently with a distance of around fourteen meters. The ground floor is a shorter distance and that's because the building is actually bigger at the ground floor um, but then that's um, there isn't an impact in terms of overlooking because of course at the ground floor it's facing towards um, existing boundary treatments and lastly in relation to the um, community hall use there's no restriction there in terms in planning terms in terms of who would be the end user only that it's proposed to be used as community space um, and that, that would be ancillary to the use of the mosque. How the mosque choose to manage that space is, is it would be a matter for them. Um, <laughs> Councillor Raymond, please. Yeah, um, Council, Councillor Upton. Thank you. Um, OK, I've got two questions, I think, really. One, one for officers and one perhaps for the applicant. Um, the one for officers, I, there's a bit of confusion about between um, in the conditions, condition number eight and condition number nine, which are on page 191. Uh, one is 
cycle store dwellings of this cycle storage community hall. Um, the but the one about dwellings talks about community hall, and then the one about community hall uh, doesn't mention whether it's dwellings or community hall. So I, I'm just confused. Are, are those cycle the Sheffield stands? At least six, which must be provided. Are those going to? Are they supposed to be for the dwellings or for the community hall? Sorry, I apologise. I think uh, um, I've been a victim of copy and paste here. Um, uh, the so on the plan in front of us uh, on the screen at the moment, the, the uh, plans actually show um, indicatively an area for the cycle storage for the flats. I was happy that that was provided, but there wasn't um, sufficient detail relating to the community hall and um, the conditions were meant to secure both. Um, so there should be um, six Sheffield stands for the, um, uh, to be installed for the dwellings and then six Sheffield stands to be installed for the community hall. Thank you, so that might need tidying up then in the, those conditions. Sorry, um, and then the second question was, I am a bit concerned about whether it's going to comply with policy RE7 of our local plan, particularly the bit that says the development does not have unacceptable transport impacts affecting communities, neighbours, etc. Um, now, it does seem that at the moment it is having some, potentially having some serious impacts on the neighbours, um, but that's the existing situation. Uh, so I'm just wondering, could the applicants comment on how many more people they think are likely to come and use the new community hall? Um, and how they are hoping that they're going to travel there. Yeah. You come forward and, and use the microphone, that's helpful. There you go. Um, so what we've got at the moment is a, an approximate 40 to 60 wait list of students from the immediate community. So we're talking about people within a walking distance of 20 minutes from the mosque. So in terms of the impact on road users, pick and drops for kids. I don't, and I, I say this honestly, um, trying to be impartial, but obviously not impartial, that it, it wouldn't really impact the number of cars that you'd see on Morden Road or Stanley Road or Ifley Road. Um, so yeah, if that answers the question. Okay. Yeah, I mean, just, just to add, Chair, I mean, in terms of policy RE7, which has seemed to come up a lot tonight, in terms of the traffic impacts, um, you know the officer's report sets out the impact on uh, on highway the highway impact. I think you just also bear in mind we've had comments from the highways authority, who are seemingly aware based on the um, objectors comments about you know reports about the, the parking pressures or the traffic pressures from the development have already been raised with the, the the county council highways authority. So they would be aware of that when making their comments. They've raised no objection to the development. They've set out a number of conditions that they think need to be included, and they've been included. I'd also remind the, the, the committee that the MPPF, the National Planning Policy Framework, is quite clear about highway impact that has to be severe for, for um, officers to recommend refusal. So I think on the basis of the information we've got, I understand there, there may well be logistical concerns in the area with how parking is is um or park or vehicle traffic to the to the mosque uh, is impacted on the local area i think obviously representatives of the mosque are here today so they're hearing that so you you know they hope that they're aware of it and, and maybe can do some see what they can do in future to manage that but there are conditions on the planning application that deal with the sort of the overall impacts from tra traffic and transport i hope that sort of additional helps can, can uh, sorry it's our weather uh, thank you. Um, uh, my question is based on uh, paragraph 1058, where it talks about the uh, adherence to policy RE2. Um, the question is really, where you've got a building like this, which is a hybrid building between non-residential and residential, which set of uh, policy RE2 takes priority? Should it be classed as a non-residential building and the whole building treated like that? Or is it the other way around, that it's a residential building and that takes priority in terms of energy use and all the other thing, good things that are in RE2? 
But the, re the report's quite clear, I think, in 1058. It actually says the proposed development falls below the threshold for non-residential development, requiring specific measures identified in policy RE2. So it's below the threshold for a non-residential building, so therefore that doesn't apply. But we need to meet the requirements relating to proposed new built dwellings. So that's so that answers your question. Sorry, where, where does it say that? Paragraph in 1058. 1058, the paragraph you referenced. Second sentence. Oh, sorry. Yes. Sorry. No, it's thank sorry. you. Um, and one further question. Um, this is quite a difficult site to get to for larger vehicles. Is there, and I'm not sure whether this is a planning issue or not, but is there an issue with um, access for emergency vehicles like large fire engines? Should should they be needed to, to access this building? I, um, if I neglected to mention this in the report, I apologise, but I did actually specifically seek that advice. Um, I wasn't 100% clear on whether that could or could not form a basis for granting planning permission, but irrespective of that, I did actually ask that, and it, I have been informed it would meet all the all the required building regulation standards. Can, can I ask a question? There's, there's, um, uh, um, there, I think that it's it's a condition that the that um, the um, flats can't be sold um, to anybody outside the mosque community. But my question is, could they be rented out to people outside the the, the, the mosque community? Yes, so I think it's envisaged that the um, that the the flats would provide um, for the needs of the of the mosque community, um, but then if the, the, I think I understand that there are situations where um, at quite short notice maybe um, tenants can be uh, are required to come they come from across the world connected with the with the mosque community, and that then provides them somewhere to stay, especially if they're coming maybe from a abroad and they're not familiar with um, the rental market in Oxford. I just want to clarify that um, a condition can't prevent the sale of a dwelling. It's, it can only control the use, but obviously yes. nobody's going to buy it. Yeah. If it can only be yeah. occupied by people connected with the mosque. Thank you. Okay. Are any other questions at this stage? Councillor Mundy. Yeah, uh, just a question regarding uh, privacy of the residents of uh, the new flats um, uh, 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 that we're looking at here, uh, in the uh, where the former annex of the mosque is, and the flats very nearby, just across the footpath, uh, which are obviously the uh, Exeter College building. Uh, is it called Hearn, Hearn Building? I mean, they're obviously very close together. Uh, I'm just concerned about the sort of pri pri privacy element there. If there are obviously windows on the uh, a warehouse, sorry, that one, yeah. So if there are obviously windows from both buildings, are we sure that there's not going to be an overlooking issue uh, regarding uh, residents of both of those blocks? It's in the officer report, actually, that those windows will be obscure glazed and they're recommended to be obscure glazed. And they all be clear, so they're already obscure glazed on, uh, on the, on the uh, warehouse site. Sorry, no, the windows in warehouse are not obscure glazed, but the proposed windows on this building would be obscure glazed, so there would be no impact in terms of overlooking because they, there would be no outlook from the proposed windows. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? Oh, sorry, because just sorry. check if that's enough, though. Because, I mean, if obviously, if you can open a window, I'm not, you know, just, just to be sort of clear on it, and I'm, I'm just, you know, obviously, if there are windows in the, in, the, in the building that's already there that can be overlooked and that's that proximate, then I'm, I just want to be clear that that's, that's still um, sufficient. I, I, I can assure I, I can assure Councillor Mulley that the uh, um, that we that this is a very common practice that the the windows obscure glaze they're non opening below a height of one point seven meters so there would be no way that anybody would be able to look out from those windows across the across the alleyway into the student bedrooms there would be a sort of like a rather like a bathroom window and in fact these windows all serve in um, essentially like secondary areas apart from. Uh, the ground floor community space where there are other windows on the other side. Thanks for that. Please, we're, we're, this is it's not a this is not a public meeting. Okay. Any any other questions? Yeah, yes. Councillor. Sorry, maybe I've just missed something about the parking issue here. So there are three parking spaces. Check 
on the site and they'll remain. Is that correct, officer? Yeah, okay. Um, the surrounding area where there's been concerns about parking, is that in a CPZ or not at the moment? No, it isn't a CPZ at the moment. Okay, mm -hmm. all right. So there should, in, in theory, be some control going on about parking and how it's actually yeah. being managed. Um, okay, thank you very much. Um, just check, are there any more questions at this stage? Okay. Um, comments? Yeah. yeah. Um, it's kind of a bit late, I know. Um, there were objections uh, regarding the light pollution and overlooking, uh, which we have asked the question. And then the issue remains about the parking and the surrounding streets. It is in CPZ, it is in LTN. And those issue, uh, as we talked early on, and we will be talking, I think, for some time until <laughs> I am here in this city because there are parking and transport issues which are the bigger and broader impact. I did see a number of photographs which are sent around for parking, which are should be dealt by the the control plus people and the county should be taking action because there is a, a scheme in place there. So uh, looking on overall application, I don't see much of grounds for refusal. There are a number of things which people do say, but are they strong enough to stand if there is a refusal? So I don't think, and in that uh, circumstances, I think we should go with the officer recommendations. Yeah, um, yeah, so um, I don't think that some of the objections that the object, um, the people that were talking, um, was they difficult, they may be for them, um, but um, I don't think this additional building makes them any worse. Um, and I think that's what we're looking at today. Um, and I think um, removal of the six HMOs to actually two two bedroom flats would be a better use of the land. So therefore, I'd like to second Mr. Kaz with all the conditions attached. Yeah, thank you, Jay. Now, I just uh, want to contribute in the, uh, the piece of information. I was a county councillor between 2009 and 13 when the CPZ was coming in the area. And I make sure Stanley Road was uh, involved in there because that's where it stopped in a phase one and then the other areas Mogland, Mogland Road wasn't included so I wanted to make sure because there was a, a parking issue in Stanley Road those days and then obviously it's been extending beyond now so the almost whole area is CPZ and there's no parking anymore on Ifri Road and so on that's all. I, mean, I can see no planning grounds to refuse it I am worried it's a tight space, basically this, and you know this is going to lead to increase of activity, there's no doubt about that. It will also lead to a better use of the space on the site. So there are pluses and minuses going on here. What I would say to all the parties in the room, but particularly those who are responsible for the mosque and the hall at the back, you have a public duty really to make sure that on the parking side, those visiting the mosque behave well. What we can't have happening here is an expansion of activity and then a sort of running battle around parking in these narrow streets. That's not good for community relations and it's not good for the city and it's not good for its reputation. So I, I give it the green light in my head on planning grounds, but there's a social responsibility here which needs to be taken seriously by all the parties uh, because it would be awful if having expanded the facilities it led to a deterioration in community relationships in this part of Oxford. We've got enough issues with community relationships, frankly, in the city at the moment, for all sorts of other reasons, nothing to do with this application. It would be sad if this was to, to, to be added to it. So that's the, on that basis, I'm prepared to support the application. Thank, thank you, Nigel. So we haven't um, posed on the table. Um, can I um, can I just suggest something, it, just, just stress something? Um, it's mentioned in the report that the importance of landscaping scheme, and it says, it says 
previous schemes have not been completed. So I would really urge that this be looked at very carefully and followed up um, if we to grant permission. Thank you. Sorry, Councillor Douglas, you want to come in? Um, could you comment, uh, with apologies if I've missed this, could you comment on the issue raised by the Residents Association about appropriation of the alley at the rear? Mm. So there is a shared, um, there's a shared alleyway that runs, we're actually talking about this alleyway here, um, rather than the, the sort of the main public alley that connects Morton Road and Stanley Road. This one runs behind the properties in Morton Road and Stanley Road. It's a shared alleyway. Um, I dealt with a planning enforcement issue there many years ago. I don't think anybody knows actually who, who owns the alleyway. Um, but the mosque um, and the other residents have a right of access over it and, and use that access. The mosque currently have that access. And I don't think there's nothing shown on the plans to show that they're looking to seal that off for their sole use. They're, the plans clearly show that their access is coming off of that alleyway. Oh, um, Louise. Thanks. Yeah, last one. I, I think it's great that there are going to be a couple of really nice flats there rather than what's falling down at the moment. And that's, you know, bonus some extra living space in the city. That's great. Um, uh, I am worried about the... Uh, the transport issues but i just on that um I'd, I'd like to just say if if the mosque we would love to work with you on uh sort of some active travel measures um you know electric bike hire things there's some great groups in the city like joy riders who work particularly with women who haven't cycled much before and get show them routes to cycle through the city so obviously that's nothing to do with planning but i just wanted to make that offer we would love to to work with you to help try and solve these problems because i mean all all places of worship have these problems with parking the churches mosque everywhere has it it's not peculiar to anyone yeah, thanks that's fine. thanks thank you okay so we've got um proposal on the table um that's seconded okay can i see all those in favor of this application that's unanimous okay so that is that is that is passed um it's very late, but I just quickly want to go through the the minutes. Um, so if, if um, members of the committee can bear bear with me while we quickly do that. So uh, agenda, agenda item seven, um, go through for accuracy and minutes um, um, mass arising. Um, page 197, yep. 198, 199, 200, 201. Yeah. 202, yeah. <laughs> 203, yeah. I hope you're giving this due attention, uh, 204, 205, 206 yeah. and 207. All, um, all I would um, alert committee members to is that the next meeting is being held at County Hall. Um, because this room is being used for the counting of postal votes, I believe. So um, if you do turn up here, you'll have a quick run down to County Hall um, and you may be a bit late. OK, thank you, everybody, for your patience and your contributions.